Welcome to Senate Education, uh, Thursday, February 2nd, 1.30. We're going to uh, do a walkthrough, start with a walkthrough on the summer study on income tax versus property tax to fund education. We're then going to continue our conversation around school safety. We're going to jump then into early childhood education and get a sense of what's, what's out there right now. We know there's an early childhood bill uh, on both sides of the House and the Senate. We want to get a not so much of an overview of the bill, we want to get a sense of the landscape of early childhood. Hear a little bit then from Jen Samuelson. People may recall she was in uh, last week, State Board of Education, to talk about their resource needs going forward. And then Pension 101, Pensions 101. Those who watched yesterday will remember that we talked about teacher salaries and we also talked about benefits a little bit. Uh, this will give us a sense of where, where we are with pensions and then mental health in schools. So, uh, and then a little preview for those who don't have the agenda in front of them tomorrow, probably start about one o'clock and end by three, uh, if not a little bit before that. Uh, and I think uh, we'll call it a pretty good week. So with that, uh, Ms. Richter and Ms. Shepard, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Great. Um, I think if it's okay with the committee, I will start off. I'm legislative counsel. My name is Abby Shepard. And I'm Abby, do you mind just waiting one second? Mm -hmm. Any chance, yeah. Hayden, you could hit that got it button? There we go. Perfect. Now we can see you <clears throat> a little clearer. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, so do, does your committee like to have a uh, testimony with screen sharing or how do you prefer would, to oh, oh, do the presentation? That would be great. Yes, yeah, screen, screen share. share. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes. Sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, yes, please. Yes, okay, please. thank you, my apologies. Uh -huh. Great. Um, hopefully that is appearing. Um, this is on the web page. It is under the uh, committee's name, not under my name. Make it a little bigger. There we go. Um, so this uh, study committee was enacted last session in Act 175. Um, and it did have a detailed list of charges that the study committee had to consider. Um, and the committee did meet six times over the fall. Um, initially, the language did require meeting beginning in July, but there was another act that had a very similar study that was created um, that was composed primarily of, ad of administration um, individuals uh, at the Department of Taxes, at the Agency of Education, and then with uh, consultation with JFO. Um, so once that committee had done um, its work, this committee began to meet in the fall and heard from different, um, different contributors to that study committee. They did then have their own report, which is also available on the legislative reports webpage, on the legislature's webpage. Um, so you'll see these two, and there are some differences in the recommendations. So the charge for this particular committee, and before I even jump into that, I do want to say Julia, Richter, and myself, um, we staffed the committee, but as you know, we're legislative council and joint fiscal office, we're nonpartisan employees, so none of these recommendations reflect our um, individual views. We're just here to provide the overview much in the same way we do walkthroughs of legislation or other policy proposals. Um, so the, the Income-Based Education Tax Study Committee was charged with studying and making recommendations for uh, shifting the existing property tax system to an income-based system. Um, there is a list of powers and duties, what the study committee was expected to look at under its legislative charge. Um, and what I really want to highlight here that came out of the first maybe two meetings when the study committee was meeting was that given the time constraints, the six meetings that they had to deliberate, uh, the committee decided not to contemplate whether an income-based education tax should be enacted, but how it would be structured. So this report really focuses and drills down on the administrative side and some of the hurdles that 
creating an income-based tax uh, structure would require. Um, so moving on from there, I will, here, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can scroll without making anyone sick. Um, I'm going to jump to the conclusion. Um, in this, so this report was structured in a way that starts with what the charges were um, and then actually answered some additional questions and did decide to um, leave some of the charges and some other issues that were highlighted um, to the deliberations of the General Assembly. Um, so within, within about 30 pages, the report lays out the recommendations, but then also makes references to all of the work that was done during the committee meetings. And Julia Richter from JFO has a lot more information on what was modeled and considered and ultimately was not recommended. Um, so all of that preamble, the committee did recommend if an income-based tax um, were to be enacted, the committee recommended that the homestead portion of the property tax, not the non-homestead, so homestead, which is primary dwelling and the surrounding land, that that property tax would be repealed and replaced with an income-based education tax um, that would have progressive rates and uh, brackets in the same way that the personal income tax has. Um, so I just want to stop there before I dive into more of the details to see if there are any questions. And I'm happy to take a step back um, and explain the existing structure as well, since um, I know you've had some primers on education property tax, but I don't want to get too into the weeds until um, I'm sure that you know where, where I'm going. So I'll pause there. I think we're good. <clears throat> good, great. Um, so within, uh, so you have the existing structure right now where you have homestead and non-homestead property taxpayers. The homestead property taxpayers under existing law do um, those who are eligible both based on income and the value of their property can claim a homestead property tax credit. The recommendation from the study committee was to repeal the homestead property tax and the associated credit. The credit is where there's a lot of complexity um, that tends to uh, confuse and frustrate many taxpayers. So that was one of the focuses of this committee um, was how to address both the, the complexity of the system, how to simplify it, but also how to make it more equitable. And the committee did consider um, the general principles of a good tax system. Um, that is part of the report from uh, NCSL does have um, sort of a list of the different principles to consider for a tax system. So the committee did focus on several of those principles, notably simplicity and equity. Um, but also noted that those principles, um, including progressivity in a tax system, can sometimes be in tension with each other. So trying to achieve one may be at the expense of another, one of those principles. And Ms. Shepard, uh, you know, you, you don't want us looking at anything right now, correct? You know there's nothing on the screen. Yes, We've actually, why don't I, I, so I will share my screen again if that's, okay. I think that so might be ready. helpful now. I'll return to that. So, just trying to make this bigger for you. There we go. So the both the executive summary and the conclusions have a list of the primary recommendations from the study committee. I am showing you the conclusions because this also highlighted sort of the unanswered questions and the policy decisions that would need to be made to hammer out a lot more detail in, into what would need to happen to actually create this new structure. Um, so as I said, the an income-based education tax, if this were enacted, would be structured very similarly to the personal income tax. So with progressive marginal tax rates and income brackets, um, what diverges from personal income taxes, it would be on adjusted gross income. So not taxable income, you'd be getting into different definitions of income. Um, but it, similarly to the personal income tax, it would apply to all Vermont taxpayers. So both residents, part year residents and non-residents who have Vermont income. Um, the rates would be adjusted to local education spending decisions. So for those of you who are familiar with the Brigham decision um, in Act 60, the way that, that, that the legislature um, 
in, enacted Act 60 in response to Brigham, the state is constitutionally required to provide substantially equal access to educational opportunity, but the means of funding that education is not set out in the Constitution, um, nor is there a requirement for local spending decisions to be factored into that. That said, the committee did um, focus on local spending and local decisions as, um, as a policy priority. So the recommendation was to keep local educa uh, education spending decisions local. Um, so the rates would reflect those local decisions and they would increase or decrease according to local education spending. And that would be compared to prior year average education spending. Um, in terms of setting tax rates uh, and the timing for setting tax rates, the committee recommended that the current structure be maintained. There would be some shifting and certainly amendments to statutory language so that it would be the education income tax that would be um, set rather than the homestead property tax yields. Um, so there would still be the process where there's sort of this ministerial calculation by the Department of Taxes um, that is made public every December 1st. And then rather than it being used to set yields, that would be used to set the education income tax rate as well as uh, the non-homestead rate. And ultimately the General Assembly would have the discretion to set those rates. Um, and those would be based on revenues in the education fund and um, raising enough to fund local education spending. Um, the way that the tax so the, oh, yeah. sort of the uh, best way to describe it to constituents would be or really would be we're moving this direction. It's it's mm -hmm. more about salary than anything else. That's correct. So the education income tax, the tax base, what's actually being subject to tax would not have any link to property. It would be purely income. So whether that's wages or interest income or business income, um, that would be the tax base instead of property. That said, I do want to again highlight this, this proposal did not uh, suggest removing the non-homestead property tax. So there would still be property tax on uh, second homes, commercial properties, um, anything that's not a homestead, so primary dwelling. So one of the things I've seen over the years in Vermont, you know, you, particularly in the Northeast Kingdom, I think, you know, you might have a, a beautiful home, but you and your wife bought it in 1965. And it bought it maybe for $35,000, and now it's worth, I don't know, half a million dollars. And they really would struggle paying those property taxes. Uh, and sometimes it forces people to sell, use that income to buy something smaller, or even leave the state. So in some ways, it would protect those folks. Uh, and really again uh but it, you know i could see in, in a lot of in some other communities maybe more urban communities i don't know if that's accurate but you would have you know the, the people that are making the bigger salaries are going to have bigger houses uh and so in those areas uh it might be a bit of a bit of a wash that's not really looking for well I would like you to respond to that and actually you can tell me if I'm heading in the right direction or completely off base. Generally, yes. If I may um, kick that to Julia Richter, because I think that gets into looking at the actual data um, and the changes um, that would occur in the whole system. Um, shifting from looking at property with a credit based on income and property value, moving away from that and purely looking at income. Yeah, sure. Uh, for the record, Julia Richter, Joint Fiscal Office. So this is something that the committee did talk about, and we did do some modeling for that. I would say, Chair Campion, um, your intuition is, is certainly correct for some property owners. 
Um, but it's important to keep in mind that this would be replacing the homestead property tax and homestead property tax credit. So it really determined it's really determined um, how it would impact a homestead property owner is really that relationship between their income and their property value. So those are the two factors that are currently determining a um, the homestead property tax liability. It's, it's that homestead, the household income, and the property value. Um, and then and then one step beyond that, and I know that Abby is going to get, get to this a bit further in the walkthrough of the committee's recommendations, but there's a potential expansion of the, um, of who is paying um, towards this portion of the education fund, right? So currently it's the homestead property owners that are covering the homestead property portion. Um, and many of them are receiving at least some sort of income sensitivity. Um, but with the expansion or the change of the homes of this, this amount of money now being raised by an income tax, that is going to then, um, depending on how it's structured, shake out to, to individuals who do not own homestead property. Does that, does that help answer your question? It does. So if you could summarize for us, what was sort of the motivating factor of the committee gathering? Do you remind us of that? Was it inequities? Was it schools weren't getting funded? Was it, you know, just general discrepancies around uh, who was paying for schools? Like what were some of those things in the early discussions. Yeah, so there was in the in the um, in the early discussions, the committee did look at um, as as Abby mentioned, NCSLs, you know, six principles of good tax system. So those are things like fairness, equity, uh, and equity, simplicity, economic competitiveness. Um, and stability it's there's there's the six principles so the committee did discuss some of those and did have discussions but but ultimately um while a lot of those discussions did focus around that tension between simplicity and fairness there wasn't in it necessarily an explicit um statement that i'm aware of that the committee made regarding that the answer to that question with respect to the the intent of the committee and the legislation i'm not sure if abby wants to jump in on that or if we would defer to to the legislators um what their intent was senator hashim so i i just have a general question which i think stems from my lack of knowledge in this area but you know one of my concerns has to do with you know, poor communities where the salary is well below the median um, income in Vermont, and then your very wealthy communities. And what, you know, one of my concerns is, you know, there's still going to be, if, if, what, what I'm worried about is a, a lack of equity when it comes to poor communities compared to affluent communities and how those schools in the different communities are going to be funded uh, based on the demographics. So I'm not sure exactly what my specific question is, but if you have any um, thoughts to share on that, I would appreciate it. Um, maybe I'll take a first stab at it and then Julia, you can add um, to it. So the uh, tax rate would reflect local spending decisions. So um, assuming one district um, in a more affluent area is voting to spend more, that would increase the tax rate um, because there would be the prior average education spending. If they're spending above that, then that tax rate in that school district would increase. The individual's tax rate would be increased accordingly. However, they also would be taxed on the, in those progressive uh, brackets. So depending on the amount of their income. Um, so if it's a lower income individual, their tax rate would already be lower. And then as their income is increasing, they would be subject to a higher tax rate. Those would be set in statute. And then um, the uh, rate would be sort of either inflated or deflated, depending on local spending decisions. Thank you. And if I may follow up to to what Abby said, I've, um, I mean, everything that Abby just said is I'm 
completely correct. And I, and I also think it's helpful to keep in mind the context that the current education fund, while we have these locally adjusted homestead property tax rates, it still is a statewide education fund. So in, in, in the current structure, the, the property tax rate is not a reflection of the property wealth in that town, but it's, as Abby said, it's the reflection of the local spending decisions. So that, that, um, that intuition that would remain the same in the, the proposal from the committee. When other states have moved in this direction, and I suspect have other states moved in this direction, I, I'm not looking at him, but I can see Colin's head saying no. Uh, but um, would we, we would be the first state to do this? Okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so there is nothing out there that says, all right, this happened, and then, um, you know, again, from where I'm sitting, I, I, I think, and this would be, I'd be curious to know, and it gets a little bit to what Senator Machine was asking, uh, I wonder if we could see a pretty significant decrease in what funding would look like for schools, but um, <clears throat> I think that would depend. Senator well, my assumption would be number crunchers would maintain the the income, the revenues coming into the program, and they would adjust income tax in this case to match, to, to provide a sufficient amount of revenue to cover the current and projected costs. Uh, they wouldn't just create a system that uh, under uh, underfunded the, the program from the start. I mean, all you have to do is match the current income revenue yeah. with the replacement system. Yeah. Isn't, isn't it that? Kind of, I mean, simplistic, but you know, you you just have to find that equilibrium, yeah, and then start with a new, you know, with a new revenue source being income tax versus property tax. Simplistic example, though. yeah, yeah. Ms. Shepard, do you want to respond to that? <clears throat> or Ms. Yes, that. Um, so the education fund and the way that education is funded in Vermont is sort of the reverse of the general fund process where you have a certain amount of revenue that you then decide how to spend. It's sort of flipped on its head for the education fund. So you have education spending, education spending decisions that then drive the amount of revenue that is raised through currently property tax, but in this proposal would be through the non-homestead property tax, all other revenue sources, and this um, income tax. Um, so you would not be decreasing the amount of uh, funding for education through this proposal. And potentially, to Senator Hashim's point, potentially a community could then decide they want to uh, increase uh, or uh, establish um, an additional tax relative to their to their community relative to their own needs, but that's you know that's separate from creating the general education uh, fund, which would be would be filled by um, uh, this you know in this new example with um, uh, with income tax with the tax on income community could add, could could bump up could add an additional tax on top of that if they were if they chose to yeah. again simplistic perspective. Yeah, that's 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 when I, I need the simplistic perspective. <laughs> <laughs> and how that how it Senator Beach just outlined might interact with the Brigham decision if you're also raising additional funds because districts do raise additional funds now, and I and sometimes there are penalties and all that kind of thing. Correct. Um, so when you say the word penalty, I assume you're referring to the excess spending penalty. Yeah, the which excess. Is currently, yeah. yes. So that is currently, um, there's a moratorium on that for several more fiscal years. Um, there is within the definition of education spending in Title 16, there is already um, sort of an exclusion from that for other funding sources, um, including any governmental funding sources, fundraising. Those are already excluded from the education spending definition and it's that definition that that drives um, how the tax rate is set for that local uh, school district. Sorry, uh, did I just confuse? No, no, <laughs> can't no quite thank see you. Your faces. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. 
Um, I did also want to make the point that um, the education tax rates were not set in this proposal for that exact um, reason you were just discussing, Senator, of how to uh, raise the amount of revenue that's currently being raised to fund education. If, it, if the tax base were to shift, um, how would those rates adjust to spending? And that there's a sort of cascade of policy decisions that would impact how the rates would be set. The primary, sort of, I'd say primary because it's probably the most expensive policy decision is what to do with renters. And that was one of the legislative charges because if renters are um, paying through the rent in theory, they're paying um, the non-homestead property tax because that would be considered like a commercial property because it's even though it's a primary dwelling, the, owner, the individuals living there are not the owners their uh, property would be subject to non-homestead property tax, but renters would also be paying based on their income. So that was that is one of the charges that this committee was asked to look at is how would renters either be held harmless or exempt from either the new income tax or um, non-homestead property tax. So the proposal in this uh, report was to create a credit um, based on the amount of rent paid that would um, be available to renters to offset um, both the income, to offset the income tax, because the assumption is that they are already paying uh, the non-homestead tax through rent. So I, I flag that because it is one of the more expensive um, in terms of what the education fund would have to, uh, would have to support is um, a renter credit which would then impact tax rates for homeowners and other um, anyone else who is paying the income tax throughout the state. Um, so that this report does not propose um, rates or um, the precise uh, marginal brackets or structure for an income tax because those policy decisions would have to be made first. Um, additionally, the non-homestead tax was not, um, a rate for that was not specifically proposed. There is one already under statute. It is typically not listed each session um, to raise sufficient revenues to fund education. Somewhat related, would one of you mind emailing us when you have time? I know I could Google this, but you get all these different reports out there. Where Vermont falls, in New England and then in the United States as it relates to property tax. I mean, I have a sense and I've seen different things out there, but I would, I would like to see that number. Um, a comparison of the property tax liability or rates? Property tax yeah. rates. Okay. So I, I might defer to Julia here because she may have so done- for example, well, maybe, maybe I should, I can be more clear and more helpful. House at $250,000, what's it tax, what property taxes here in Vermont versus rest of New England compared to the United States, rest of the United States? I, I'd just be curious. I mean, we, I met with uh, Chair of Senate Finance today. We know we're at 85,000 students. We're going down. Things, you know, we're spending, I, I think, I don't know, it's, we're, we're spending on students. Just leave it at that. What does that look like? For some people, that's a difficult number. For others, it's an acceptable number. Uh, and so some of these things are sort of floating around my head. And I think the, it's safe to say that other committee chairs as well. So just to get a, for this committee to get a sense of what's out there as it relates to property taxes on a $250,000 home would be helpful. And if it's not 250, bump it up to 300, 200, bump it down, yeah. whatever works for all of you. Yeah, so um, I mean, it's a really you're you're raising a really interesting question that I wish I had a a, a, um, a quick answer to. The challenge with comparing property tax rates across the Northeast as well as across the United States is that Vermont is very different um, from other states because of the very, very generous income sensitivity that Vermont provides to property tax payers. So when you've got a $250 home, while 
there, there's, there's a few different things to be considered. One, the, 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 the property tax on that home is really going to differ by community based on spending decision. Um, and two, the, the total amount paid in property taxes when including the income sensitivity is going to vary dependent on the homeowners or the household income. Um, other states in the Northeast and across the country have um, their own um, property tax schemes that differ from Vermont, as well as the way that education is funded using property taxes also differs. So Vermont has these um, the statewide education fund and the, and the homestead property taxes, as well as non-homestead, go into that statewide education fund, whereas other states have different schemes for funding education. Many use local property taxes or some combination of state and local funding. Um, so those are a lot of the caveats that I would, um, or considerations that I, that I would raise when comparing property tax rates to other states. I can certainly look to pull together a comparison, but I, I do think it's important to keep all of those things in mind that it, that it is sort of looking at, at, at apples and oranges in a lot of ways. Yeah, you, you make my question actually, it was a pretty silly question. You, you quickly made me realize, of course, it's gonna you know, differ, you know, differs town to town, differs, you know, uh, not only in Vermont, but different states. And how do you get, you know, one's head around that? Uh, I'm not asking you to do any work on it, but if you happen to see something out there that is put out by a, you know, a, a solid agency or, or you know, organization, it would, be, it would be interesting to see how they sort of threaded this needle to kind of give policymakers an indication of what might be happening state to state. Certainly, I I will I will look. I I um I don't want to promise anything right now, but I can think of in the back oh, of my cool. mind a couple of helpful resources. And okay. I will say it's not a silly question at all. That's a it's a question that I've tried to answer myself many times because um it could be very informative for policy decisions. But as you mentioned, it's it is a difficult needle to thread in those really comparisons. So I think it's I think it's a it's a relevant question. Uh, if we're going to start to get our head around this topic. Uh, but um, I'm also curious, though, about uh, Ms. Richter's comment about the income sensitivity. Yeah. What's that really mean? You know, what, you know, not, not, you know, don't need a study on it, but I'm just curious if there's something which explains or outlines at a very high level what, what you meant by income sensitivity in relation to property tax. Because so I don't, you know, in this conversation to constituents, I can't get my head around. Yeah. yeah, anything would be helpful rather than current. Would you say a few words now? Sure, I can definitely say a few words now. I would also be happy to to come back and um, do a, a big picture at Finance One Hundred One. Um, when I when I'm talking about income sensitivity, uh, Vermont has you. You may have also heard of the property tax credit. Um, there's a dependent on a household's property value and a household income. So that can generally be thought of all the income of the folks living under that roof. Um, you compare the two. So the, the household value, the, the value of the homestead and, and the land and the value of the income. Um, and dependent on the relationship between those two, as well as the homestead property yield and the income yield, which the General Assembly sets every year in the yield bill, um, there's a property tax credit that may be applied to that property tax bill of that household. Um, and so essentially, you're looking at two, two um, big picture numbers to come up with ultimately what is the total tax liability or what is the total tax bill, net tax bill of that household. And that's taking into account the house site value, the homestead value, as well as the, the household income. Is that helpful? I know that that's like a few, few complex sentences, but um, I think big picture, big picture that, that, that covers it. Abby, Abby do you wanna jump in? No, nope, that was great. I, I would just add there's um, 
there are a few layers of complexity to it as well, because there is both the based on income and house site value for the state property tax credit. There is also something you may have heard called the circuit breaker um, that helps uh, individuals under a lower income threshold of $47,000. So there's also a credit against municipal taxes. Yep. And the, and the credit against municipal taxes is born is is paid out of the general fund. So the income sensitivity for education property taxes is covered by the education fund. Um, and then the, 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 the municipal circuit breaker that Abby mentioned is a general fund expense. That's right. And, and this study committee did not recommend changing um, significantly in any way that uh, municipal circuit breaker. Um, but this study committee did recommend repealing what's called income sensitivity or the property tax credit because there would no longer be a homestead property tax. Um, one other point that was made in the property tax uh, changes and recommendations within the committee's report was to the non-homestead property tax. So property tax paid on commercial and uh, so rental units, second homes, that property tax would be retained. It would actually be enlarged, uh, meaning the tax base would be bigger because uh, it would apply to parcels of land, even if they're, they have a homestead on them, um, only the homestead, so the house or dwelling and two acres would be exempt from non-homestead property tax, but the rest of the property would become uh, subject to non-homestead property tax. And that would help offset, in part, the expense of paying for a renter credit. Um, there were a few other smaller um, policy recommendations, and then several that were, um, I don't want to say punted, but were left to the discretion of the General Assembly because they would take uh, significant more, significantly more deliberation. Um, and those are listed on, this is uh, in the conclusion of the report, which is showing on the screen right now. It starts on page 26. Um, but I'm afraid I will have to leave you for another committee in about five minutes. So I might um, take any more questions or turn it over to Julia to talk about um, some of the changes that were contemplated, but were not ultimately included in the report. We also have to move into school safety, actually, in just a few minutes. But I, this is I, this is a good sort of starting, you know, the conversation and helping us dig into this. I'm going to talk to Senator Cummings to see her thoughts on what parts of this she may or may not even be contemplating. We haven't had that conversation, and based on that, I suspect she will punt some of these conversations right back to education for us to partner with finance on. So unless I see any other questions right now, I think we have your report. We have that overview of what you've provided us with this thus far, unless there's a pressing topic or issue one of you want to mention to us or something, some concluding comments. Is Richter, Ms. Shepard? No, I, I, um, I would encourage encourage the committee feel free to to reach out to to me um or to abby no i'm off for it but feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you want to um dive into you know understanding the ed finance system better i i know that it is certainly complex and i'm yeah. happy to help you work through work through understanding some of those nuances moving forward yes please feel free to reach out with any questions there's a okay. lot more um, in this report that I'd be happy to share with you. Okay, I think we'll leave it there for now. Thank hey, you both. Thank you. Ms. St. James, in our packets, we have the side-by-side, -side, I think it might've been uh, one of the gentlemen from Rutland possibly asked that we, uh, I don't remember who it was, somebody on this committee, we thought it, it made a lot of sense. And I, I agree, it makes a lot of sense to sort of see where are things now as it relates to school safety policies versus what the administration is proposing. Um, 
So for those who may have just joined us, uh, this is school safety, the administration put forward a proposal on school safety, and we're trying to understand still what direction we may head in. We are hearing from uh, different constituencies, I believe tomorrow and next week on this. But right now, let's try to get a handle on what's in statute and what might change. So with that, Ms. St. James, and we hope you're feeling a little better. Thank you. <clears throat> That's St. James, Office of Legislative Council. Um, so what I have for you is uh, side by side. You'll see these um, more often as bills bounce back and forth um, from one uh, side of the General Assembly to the other. Um, and we use them generally as just a demonstrative way to show you the differences between the House's bill versus the Senate's bill. Sometimes it's your own bill as introduced versus the changes that the committee is making. Um, and so this is actually a really friendly way to use this type of um, document because there's not a lot to compare. So the, to orient you to this document, the um, so the direction I received is the side-by-side -side on current school safety uh, statute, what's in statute now, and what's in the proposal. And so <clears throat> you'll see the proposal, if you remember, we walked through it last week, um, was relatively short. There were, um, I think, four uh, separate sections. Um, but through uh, school safety, the concept of school safety is kind of woven throughout Title 16. So I included for your review uh, chapter 33 uh, from Title 16, which is what the governor's proposal or AOE's proposal is um, suggesting, at least starting, suggesting uh, making changes to. And then I also included um, sections from chapter 25, which is attendance and discipline and contains the laws around uh, like, um, guns on uh, school property and school resource officers. And then I also contain, um, <laughs> excuse me, I also pulled out some of the sections of chapter 31 that have uh, things on there like emergency medication stock and concussion protocol. So pretty wide range. Um, but if we start at the very top of page one there, you'll see on the left-hand side, everything on the left-hand in the left-hand column is gonna be current law. And anything in the right-hand column is going to be um, the uh, proposal by the administration. And I've highlighted those that new language in yellow. So the first uh, thing you'll see there on the first page there is that the um, uh, AOE's uh, policy suggestions start by adding Section 1480 Emergency Operations Plans. Um, there's nothing specifically in current law around this topic. So there's nothing on the left-hand side you'll see there. And then the next um, section you'll see, and this is what you'll see going forward. You'll see this more um, when we look at side by side. You'll see that in the left-hand column is the law as it currently stands. And in the right-hand column, um, you'll see the law that, the, uh, that AOE is proposing. So all that language that struck through they're proposing getting rid of and then the highlighted underlined language is what they are recommending adding um, and you'll see that they are recommending changes to uh, current law in the statute related to fire and emergency preparedness drills and then our current law also in section 1482 has a um, section on safety patrols uh, this is really related to um, um, uh, schools organizing um, safety patrols uh, that involve um, like crossing guards, directing students not to cross specific areas, um, et cetera. And there's, you'll see there's nothing, there's no similar provision, there's no recommendations regarding this in AOE's proposal. And then in, we're on page four now. Um, Section 1483 is current law, and that is a requirement that this chapter, chapter 33, is printed in manuals or handbooks prepared for the guidance of teachers. And you'll notice that AOE has no similar provision or is not recommending any changes to that section. And then that's the last of the current law in this chapter. 
And then on the right hand side, you'll see that there's the rest of AOE's proposal there, the access control and visitor managed policy in the proposed section 1448. And then the um, behavioral threat assessment team proposed uh, section 1485. And that's, that's the extent of um, what I am aware of as AOE's um, school safety proposal now. Um, but again, I did just want to draw your attention that the concept of school safety is kind of woven throughout chapter 16. So I did include some other areas that, um, at least on their face, touch on that concept. I don't know if you want me to go into them or just leave it there. So, uh, Ms. St. James, just one question. I, I, I believe uh, the current uh, 1483 uh, chapter on uh, printed material handbooks and such isn't that isn't that possibly the intent of the proposed uh, 1480 emergency operations plans kind of to have a what do you call it all hazards emergency response uh, uh, pre-planning concept I, I would think I, I think that that would be what would be used for uh manuals and handbooks guidance to teachers and schools and such isn't that kind of the concept of you know again it's not, it's not critical. Here's, one of, here's one of my favorite ways to answer these questions intent is your area um so i can't speak to the intent of any proposed language that would really be for aoe to speak to or for you to okay. um define uh, um, but you'll you'll notice that aoe is proposing this in a separate statute separate from what's in current law. So whether they intended those two sections to cancel each other out or to augment each other would be a discussion to have with AOE. Okay, thank you, that's fair. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Hubbard, what was you, you, you expressed a concern last, when we first walked through the bill mm -hmm. in particular, could you remind the committee of that concern? It was related to, and I don't mean to put you on the spot anyway, but uh, okay. you articulated, it was, you know, teachers, didn't sign up to do a certain part of this right. kind of emergency planning. Yeah. And I just want to make sure I'm noting that in this. And we're going to hear from the NEA and mm -hmm. others. Um, yeah, well, I was reminded of what I said yesterday when I heard three hours of testimony on from medical professionals who've been assaulted and attacked over the last few years, um, which is just that these folks don't go into these professions to be skilled um, combatants or, you know, skilled, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? First line of defense, yeah, first yeah, responders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know that the some of the medical professionals that we listen to are definitely schooled in de-escalation. We heard a lot about that de-escalation training, but um, it's just, I don't know, the two are very disparate and don't, uh, meld well, and uh, that's been my experience working with other educators. Um, I, th I think it will dissuade some folks from entering the profession. Yeah, so that I got. Um, thank you for that. And again, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I remember you had expressed something, you, and you can it, always put me on the spot. Okay, then furthermore, <laughs> <laughs> you also said something. <laughs> Uh, okay, and we're going to hear, I think, from Mr. Robinson. Uh, why don't you take can you uh, the chair for more? <laughs> just for one moment. Um, if our need, cousin John to... Tinney is going to be here later today, okay, the, he serves on the governor's safety task force, okay. he's the one who's best equipped to speak to us on this. So, I don't want to. That's fair. Step uh, up and no, that's completely say something uh, um, in error. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, right. And um, so I won't um, ask you anything else. We'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. St. James, anything else at this point in terms of you know where we're at versus where we may be heading? This is a very, very, very helpful document. Um, no, this is really... Um, um, Without knowing more about where you want to end Aren't up, well. it's hard for yeah. me to offer any sort of advice yeah. um, other than to point out that the concept of school safety is, again, kind of woven throughout Title 16 in different areas. Um, so just because it's not accounted for in 
the chapter where we're looking at adding new language doesn't automatically mean it's not accounted for somewhere else. Um, okay. Just just to highlight that. Any other final questions? Yes, please, Ms. Robbins. I, uh, so for the record, Colin Robbins, yeah. I, I did just want to say, and you all did hear from our President Dantini the other week, and, and he did echo yeah, the points that yeah. Senator Gulick said. So um, I think that whether you're a teacher or a paraprofessional or other school employee, um, obviously folks who go into first responder professions receive tremendous, tremendous amount of hours of training to make life and death decisions in split seconds, um, as Senator Hashim knows very well. Um, and that's not uh, what necessarily teachers are going to profession. So uh, just wanted to, I think Don spoke to that previously yeah. and Senator Gulick's points, I think echo that as well. And when Mr. Tini's here, or actually in case I forget to convey this to him, if there is an alternative proposal, okay. I would like to see that. The committee would like to see that. Yeah, that would be that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Ms. St. James, thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to take a little break and come back and have Allie Richards and Sarah Kenny at 2.30 take us through early childhood education, what it looks like right now in the state. So welcome back to Senate Education, mm -hmm. Thursday, February 2nd, 2.31 in the afternoon. We have Allie Richards and Sarah Kenny, both of whom are from Let's Grow Kids. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, just to set the table here a little bit, uh, I've asked uh, Ms. Richards and Ms. Kenny to come in to talk about, just give us the overview of what early childhood education looks like right now in the state of Vermont. We know from our time, uh, well, two number of things that I think we know. Many of us have heard from constituents that this is an important issue uh, to them. We've also heard in our hallways and a recent bill was put in that puts people in kind of different paths, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, different uh, directions to move in. But just getting an overview for all of us right. would be helpful since some of this likely could end up in this committee right. if it has to do with particularly with pre-K. Right. So with that, uh, the floor is yours and any information you can provide would be great. Wonderful. Thank right. you so much. Yeah. Um, for the record, I'm Allie Richards, CEO of Let's Grow Kids. I'm joined by Sarah Kenny, Chief Policy Officer of Let's Grow Kids, and it is always an honor being here and talking about this with you all. And um, I'm going to do a very high level of just a little bit of an introduction about Let's Grow Kids, our work, the child care, early education sort of crisis and landscape in Vermont today. And then, you know, Sarah can go into a little bit more of the detail on some of those pieces that you're talking about yeah. with like the interactions of, of the different um, channels, and then we can, I think, together field questions to dig deeper in any of that as we've been living and breathing it from a policy and community perspective for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Time flies. And we have a fun. PowerPoint presentation that just kind of has some slides that highlight what Allie's going to be saying. So I'll just share the screen if Great. that works. Just yeah, absolutely. Visual for folks, absolutely. We won't Great. be like that. Yeah. Um, so very happy to be able to share the groundwork as we sort of see it for this crisis, frankly. And I, you know, it doesn't bring me pleasure to use that word, but I think you'll see with the statistics that truly that is what it is. So just first a little bit about us. Um, Vermont's child care campaign, as it sort of affectionately become known, uh, is led by Let's For Kids. We are a nonprofit organization, and we've been working on this issue from the ground up in communities for over a decade. Uh, we really do it in three ways. Um, we have been looking for true, sustainable, and long-term solutions for the zero to five early education um, crisis through policy change. And that is truly what it will take, including long-term investment. Um, and we've studied it for a long time, national studies in, within communities in Vermont um, and, and through thousands of, of discussions over many, many years. And it truly is policy change and public investment that is the answer um, to this long-term uh, situation. At the same time, while we work on policy, we have been on the ground with early educators, with community members and leaders um, for decades in that regard, understanding this issue from a school perspective, a program perspective, a workforce perspective, building pipelines, building quality, and building capacity. So I sort of say, look, we have a policy arm, we have a programs arm, but that's really, you know, 
fixing the system and readying the system for investment with a real keen eye to implementation and practical solutions that will actually work as they're rolled out. Um, and the third thing is people. Um, as you may know, we actually have over 35,000 Vermonters from all walks of life actively engaged in some way elevating their voices, sharing their stories, explaining how this works for them, for their families, and really feeding into the policy solutions we're working towards. So that's a little bit about Let's Throw Kids and just our background in a nutshell. So you know sort of where we're coming from. Um, and I'm really sorry to report that while we have been working on this for a long time, the situation in childcare has never been more dire. It's a very interesting situation because we've also never been closer to a sustainable solution. So this is the moment we're all living in. And to your point, Senator, about the bill, you know, being introduced just yesterday, that is the vehicle for transformation that we're, you know, in the game discussing this together, finally with all the pieces in place. And we'll talk more about that, you know, but why has it never been more dire? Before the pandemic hit, three out of five kids in Vermont under six who needed access to early childhood education didn't have access to it. So they needed to be in an out of home setting and they couldn't find it. Three out of five kids, that's 8,700 Vermont children who needed this, didn't have it. And that was that four, was zero to five. Zero to five. Okay. So before you enter kindergarten, they didn't have it. For those who were able to find it, families paying up to 30% of their household income on that childcare. And, you know, that's more than a mortgage payment in some case, right? But then many say, well, we feel lucky because we were able to find it. So, okay, we'll pay at all socioeconomic levels, up to 30% of income we're seeing. Um, at the same time, early educators who do this critical work with children at the most crucial time of their development. And you can certainly dive into the brain science um, at, at any time you all want to. Um, it's pretty deep, unequivocal body of research over the last 50 years about brain science, child development, and this most crucial time between the zero to five years. Um, these early educators that are with these children, educating them, nurturing them during this time are in the bottom 2% of all professions. They make on average, $14 an hour without benefits, okay? And so you guys have seen the signs on the Barry Montpelier Road for $18 an hour to work at McDonald's. So just start thinking about, right, the market forces and incentives at play here. We're talking about early child education and a system that the supply can't meet the demand. The early educator makes $14 an hour without benefits and parents are paying 30% of their income because the payers are the family and they cannot afford to pay more. And they are the early educators who are not able to take a full wage and actually have the true cost of care, you know, be present um, in their work. So at the same time, what's a little mind boggling is while this is an early child education and, and brain development issue, it's also a workforce development issue because our workforce is smaller than it's been in the last 30 years, as you well know, there are vacancies, people would like to work many, many, many majority of folks who have exited the labor force in Vermont cite childcare, the inaccessibility of it, inability to find it or afford it as a key barrier for them just get and totally exiting the work labor force altogether. So that's the dynamic that we're working with them as far as the numbers on the ground. So as I mentioned earlier, while it's never been more dire, now add a pandemic to that, these folks, were open, <laughs> most of them were open from the very beginning through this caring for our kids, caring for our children without healthcare benefits throughout the course of a pandemic. So all these systemic issues now layer on the burnout, you know, and the turnover that you see in this workforce, you know, um, and they're the workforce behind the workforce and they are seeing all those things sort of layered upon the low systemic low pay and other factors that have just, you know, created the system that we see today. Um, and yet, we're here optimistically, you know, in, in despite this really, really difficult moment. And, and really, I can't put too fine a point on it. We hear from very large, very high profile, very high quality early education programs almost every week that they are about to close, including yesterday. You know, um, so these the, and think about for a minute when they do close the impact on those families, hundreds of kids who do not get that early ed that they need, those families who cannot go to work and then all those employers who are impacted in that way. So there is good news, which is we have been working on this as a community for a long time. There is a path forward and all the puzzle pieces are in place. Um, the biggest one being two weeks ago, the RAND Corporation pushed out their financing study. Um, 
And yesterday, a draft bill was introduced. So these are key, key components. But what I want to sort of push on is we have been together with legislators, you know, championing the way, um, working on this from a policy perspective, the most clear boulder of that is H-171 or Act 45. Um, so what that did from 2001, it said it is our goal in the state of Vermont to have a zero to five high quality, affordable, accessible system of early childhood education in the state with the twin pillars. And you know, I'm biased because I have twins, they're four year old, four year old twins. So I live this and breathe this in every minute of my day. Um, compensation for early educators and affordability for families and no more than 10% of their income. Those are the pillars of this policy. And I will say there are the pillars of this policy in Vermont from H-171 and the work we did together. They are also the pillars of this policy nationally. You know, in the national bills we've seen come through on this, on all the other states who are leading on this, we have a really robust network of TA and support and, you know, sort of sharing best practices and lessons with these other states who are working on this. It's very, very validating because we're pioneers in this space. It is very validating that best practice and research has gotten us all to the same conclusions. A system of high quality, accessible, affordable early education, you know, really starts and ends with a fairly compensated workforce, which really drives quality and that affordability for families that allows for access and allows for the whole thing to work. So Ms. Richard, has another state taken this? I mean, I think municipalities, there have been some, sort of tell us what's out there in the, in the United States just generally. No state has taken a comprehensive approach okay. to zero to five the way we are okay. about to do with the bill that was introduced yesterday in Vermont. Okay. Different states have done good things on pre-K, okay. you know, good, good things on home visiting, good things on, you know, pockets of this. Yeah. You see some municipalities getting pieces of it right. Um, New Mexico just had an amazing step forward with a very unique to them funding source that they decided to put entirely towards early child education. Now, again, our source? scope, is, it was for sort of um, indigenous people's uh, lands and, you know, so, uh, oil money. Oil money oh, from okay. oil money. Yeah, so they just passed a constitutional no, no. amendment okay. in New Mexico to, to guarantee a right to early childhood education for birth to five. And New Mexico has been giving free childcare for the past year to everybody under, I think, 400% of the federal poverty level. And they will be working this legislative session to try to expand that using this um, funding that this funding source that they have to so they're like they're running in the running yeah. yes here, yeah. so. but our scale is i really think yeah. that that is an important point chair campaign which is our scale is an advantage here because there's 8700 kids who need this don't have access you know and i'll get to this in a minute through the rand report but um they put a huge chunk of change towards this and it is not going to fully fix it. It's going to move them really beautifully in the right direction. So that's, we, we are in the running to yeah. be a pioneer on this. And I'll say, why is that important? When we corner the market on this, including regionally, it has a huge opportunity for our demographics, right? You know, you can find and afford early child education in Vermont, huge pull for our workers, huge pull for young families, which you all know we need, huge pull for early educators. And that's really, really important because we know all the things we care about are heavily burdened by our demographics. And this is one of the few things that actually has a promise for this giant sucking sound of folks into Vermont, you know, in a very realistic way and young families with the support that they need. So, you know, H-171 basically then said, these are our goals as a state of Vermont. We shall 10% affordability, compensation for early educators. Then it said, here's $12 million of investment to get some foundational pieces, including an IT system. I know that's not sort of the most fun piece of the puzzle, but it is a necessary one. And it has already been funded and established through, you know, the child development division at AHS. And these are really important building blocks. Then it said, what questions do we still not have the answers to? How exactly are you going to govern this, you know, what, govern and regulate the system in an accountable data-driven way? And how are you going to pay for it? How much does it really cost to go from today to where we need to be? So the first was a governance study done by national partners that came to Vermont, did a robust stakeholder process with building bright futures as a partner and gave solid recommendations, primarily the, the punchline being a single empowered entity in the state of Vermont that has accountability over the system and ensuring it happens. And uh, that, and they, that report was published last summer and is available and is a big part of the discussion that we have so today. Now, 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Not the Department of Education or mm -hmm. the Agency of Education. It was agnostic as to exactly where, but it basically um, described the situation, showed what other states sort of do, some of the lessons learned in good and bad directions from other states, and took a really, I would say, pragmatic look at the politics and policies on the ground in Vermont and made this recommendation of an empowered entity, sort of you pick where. But then they suggested actually that it had dual reporting to AOE and AHS to ensure that there was at least both um, voices. Is there anything you'd add to that? Just that the, the single empowered entity was the key component of what they recommended. They did their initial recommendation was a new separate like agency of early childhood education, which some other states have gone for. And they said, if that is impractical right now, there's also another option for um, having a single empowered entity who, as Ali's saying, sort of cross across agencies um, and be able to support all of the early education related work happening across both agencies. Exactly. And um, I'm certain that the folks who authored that report, Building Bright Futures, was tasked by you all with doing that report and they contracted with these national experts who did the report and I'm sure that they'd be happy to come in and talk to you more about the, what was in that yeah. report. I do recommend um, a, a look at that. It was very good work. They wrote, the consultants who did it, wrote the book on governance for early childhood uh, systems across this country. And um, they did a very robust process. They spent a lot of time in Vermont talking to key folks. Um, so it is a good resource, in our opinion. Um, the other study was the RAND report. And that came, is what came out two weeks ago. And that was the final piece of the puzzle. So if the punchline, again, is sustainable public investment that actually allows this to be a public good that is funded enough for the supply to meet the demand, early educators get paid, so the true cost of delivery, and then affordability for families at a reasonable percentage of their income. Um, how much does that cost? So the RAND report um, was an incredibly important moment in this narrative because what it said was, here are real numbers from an objective third party that is trusted by this body and has done actually this exact launch pad work for other sectors like the tax and regulate um, cannabis system in Vermont. Uh, they came in, they said, here is through our lens, the numbers on the ground and gave a cost estimate that ranged from 179 to $279 million with the underlying factors that, you know, sort of drive those numbers. And then they made recommendations as to how you fund it and basically concluded it is within Vermont's means and reach financially to fund this system for the outcomes that you seek within sort of our collective financial means. And so that's what we've been waiting for, sort of a, a nod to, yes, here's a blueprint. It's not everything, I wanna be very clear, but it is for this body to take and say, okay, we now have the detail on paper that we can now use to run. And that's where you see that bill being introduced yesterday, which is a huge step forward. So, so yes, may, please. please. Uh, so if all of a sudden, so if I or someone on this committee had two children mm -hmm. under five, mm -hmm. How does the RAND, RAND report sort of distribute funds, or how does that sort of what what was their sort of process in this? You know, would, would it would would I register the child to go and get reimbursed, or how would that? Just tell us a little bit about that. And that gets into so I'll start and, and yeah. toss it over to you no, because that okay. gets into a lot of the mechanics. I think that you're getting to as well, Center Campaign, which is. Um, there is a mechanism today called child care financial assistance. And again, to your question about what other states are doing, et cetera, there is a best practice. It's pretty well trodden, right? We've been studying this issue. What do children need zero to five yeah. Yeah. for 50 plus years? Um, and we really haven't moved on it as a country or a state because it takes dollars, yeah. right? So there has been that the only benefit to that is, uh, you know, the, the very sad part is we really know what our kids and families need and we just haven't acted on it. But the good news is we've had a lot of time to understand a lot of the unintended consequences, the research, the policy, sort of best practices. Um, so childcare financial assistance is the current vehicle. It basically is a sort of pipeline of funds into the actual delivery, so a child care program. We have what's called a mixed delivery system today in Vermont, so it can yeah. be a for-profit, non-profit child care center, a school-based pre-K, or a home-based child care home. They're governed by, you know, the same sort of yeah. regulations. Um, and again, all this is stuff we can really dive deeply into. So that's helpful. That, helpful. That, that yeah. answers the question. And the random and was based on that. Based on system. that. And okay. I will just go one step further because it's an interesting situation that actually comes into play a lot when, when we think about the dynamics of childcare policy. You sort of just can't do one thing without the other. 
which is also why you hear us out there talking a lot about you can't partially fund the system anymore. If you partially fund the system, it's just almost not a good use of money anymore, right? We've built the system, we've understood it, we've shored it up. And now you basically need to say, this is either public infrastructure, zero to five, or it's not. And so for example, you see some proposals that only will increase the affordability for families. That just means you're gonna get more families tuition assistance so they can afford childcare. That doesn't mean that childcare is going to be available. What do I mean by that? It's all the same sort of coin. That's what child care financial assistance is. That's what the Rand Court sort of said. You basically say, this is how much money it costs to run an early education program. The main factor of that cost is the salary and compensation of the early educator in the room, like any business. So basically you say this, we have said, you know, this is a, this is a private market. We haven't said this is public infrastructure. So we don't actually allow there to be enough money in the system as the parents are the key payer to pay a full wage. So what this says is, look, this is a, Rand says, if you really want to fix this, you say, this is the true cost of this care with a real wage to that early educator. And this is how much it costs. And that's just the true cost of care. And then tell me how much your household incomes of your families are. And then we'll give you, you know, the subsidy so that they pay no more than 10% of their household income. And you're getting as a program, the true cost of care. So you can actually run a program and have your early educators get a wage. Why is this so crucial? That's why it all comes together. If you do one piece without the other, you will not have enough child care. You'll not have enough early childhood education spaces um, and it won't be affordable. So it all sort of works together in that way, which is I just really critical. That's why I'm sort of leaning on that. It's sort of a little bit of a complexity of it. It's a strength and a weakness of it, right? It's also why it sort of works beautifully and so you can push this money in through that way. But if you sort of only do one piece of the puzzle, you just, uh, it, it won't work. Yeah, a thousand questions. Um, Great, we love them. Uh, so if the shortfall is 9,000 children, mm -hmm. yeah. but the cost, the RAND cost is quarter million? Yes. No, 250 million. Yes. It's roughly 27,000 per student. Yeah. And the sh this is a short, this is a gap. But currently we're, uh, our education system is probably roughly 18,000 per student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? What's the delta? Well, so a bunch of really good questions. There's two key two things of that. So first of all, this money, the gap, isn't just to fund the children who do not have access today. What it does is it says to a childcare sector. Isn't that the most sector, But it's all, it all happens at the same time. So basically, if you look at early childhood education program A in Vermont today, they're paying their people $14 an hour without benefits. They cannot hold on to their workforce. They cannot meet the need. They're closing. You're right. It's it, there's and they can't expand or grow. What this money does is it goes in three different ways. It, it goes in to allow for more children to have access to your point. It just as much immediately goes in to pay wages to all the, early, all the early educators who are currently doing this work today. And then three, it gives Vermonters a rebate so they can afford childcare, including all the Vermonters that pay for it today. So every dollar goes to a human. It goes to lifting the wages of all the early education workforce, the current and the new, to all Vermonters who can actually pay only 10% of their income, the current and the new, and then it allows for all that access for okay. all those new. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So where's the private industry? Where, where's that reflected in this? In what way? Well, I think what you're proposing, I think if the RAND solution is mm -hmm. is what you're supporting, I sense that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a there's a there's there's currently a private sector. Is the private sector you know, is this like pure public, like hundred percent public? Okay, that's right. You mean the, the dollars. The, you mean the private programs that are providing the service right now? No, the private companies. companies. Private companies. Oh, and yeah, employers no. who right. are helping employees? Or... That, yes, plus just private industry. Mm -hmm. Somebody's setting up, right. you know, they're not, it's not a state uh, facility. It's a private, it's a commercial facility providing mm -hmm. uh, daycare or, you know. Okay. So you do mean the current child care programs. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the, what we have today, I believe is what you're asking, is a mixed delivery system. Right. So you, it, it basically says you could be a nonprofit or for-profit, but it's almost entirely, it all is private. It is private. 
that with the exception of some schools who are offering pre-K to three and four-year-olds only. And so they, what we're basically saying is the model of childcare has never worked. It basically leaves it entirely to the private, which says you basically create your own business, you charge families more than they can pay, and you cut corners on your costs by not providing the true cost of care. You're not paying wages to your early educators. You're not be able to do the true quality that we all need. So what this system is in this country and best practice is that you then take public dollars to fill the gap. So it's basically a tuition assistance, public tuition assistance okay. into that. Um, but there's a sub sub section of families that provide their own care. <laughs> Mothers, mm -hmm. fathers, whatever. Yeah. They choose to bring, they stay out of the workforce and they bring up their children until age five. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then, yes, they take advantage of a state provided uh, education mm -hmm. system or not. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, starting at roughly age yeah. five. Is sure. this, that wouldn't change under yeah. families would so, still have that. So, option. do the numbers include those families? So we do numbers because mm -hmm. that was one of those things they just yeah. like flew by at yeah. you know, ten thousand. Yeah, they did not assume that a hundred percent of families would be using childcare in their estimates. Okay, we have a likely to need care estimate, and we have done a supply and demand analysis every other year, and we do it by county and by state, and it's based on census data. And the the likely to need care threshold in Vermont, to your exact point, Senator, is about seventy percent of kids under five have all available parents in the workforce and need some form of out-of-home care. 70% of youth between zero and five need between birth and five. Need have some all their form. available parents in the labor force. Yeah. So that means that they're likely to need some kind. And for some families that means a grandparent or you know some other option, but right. most of those families are going to require some kind. And then there's also the universe of families who maybe aren't in the labor force right now because they can't find child care because it's such a scarcity right now. So Rand and their estimates, I think they're actually getting back to you all with exactly what they used for percentages of the likely to need care population at each age bracket, but they did not assume that every family with a kid under five would be in childcare. So the system would still would remain entirely voluntary for families, but would I think the key difference is that there are so many families right now who are not working as much as they would like to or working the, the job that they would like to or are not in the labor force at all because they cannot find childcare because we have this scarcity right now. So that's what this would help address. And what I love about your line of questioning is you are uncovering why best practice in this country is this sort of public private marketplace. This is what it is. Basically what we're have been promoting, which is again, very well trodden and well researched is a public private marketplace with, with the sort of the public support to make the market forces work. Cause right now the market forces don't yeah, allow the supply to make the demand. And that's the equilibrium I don't get. I don't understand why, why the private, you know, private uh, childcare mm -hmm. is not a larger part of the solution. It is the entire solution. It's just not working. The business model underlying it doesn't work because basically what, and, and I will say it would be great for us to talk to some of our business champions who've been leading the charge on this at some point because they help explain it beautifully. It's basically you're charging your customers for your product more than they can afford. That's why supply right. does not. There's always money. a safety net for the, you know, what you can't afford, but mm -hmm. I'm just, I, I, I'm, mm -hmm. Let me just listen more and I'll and Great. Do that. Center, yeah. Yeah. Great. I appreciate it. Thanks. So so when I've been thinking about child care for the past year, I mean I've been thinking about it in two different with two different prongs. You know, the first being that it's you know the good and right thing to do to make sure that kids have, you know, between zero to five, you know, are, they have opportunities to learn and you know do things that um, help them with positive development. But then there's the second part of it, which is the economic impact. Mm -hmm. And you know, you you guys are living and breathing childcare, so you're far more articulate than I am when it comes to the economic impact. But I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on how this will impact not just you know the individuals who are who are, who are getting rebates and you know making sure that childcare workers have a livable wage. You know, what, what type of effect would this have on the entire state? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want me to start? Yeah. I, I don't want to talk all about no, no, it. I don't want to go in for my greatest hits. This is my so. favorite question. <laughs> yeah, we you know, the goes begs the question of why does Lester Kids exist? Mm -hmm. It's not because, you know, we just think childcare is a fun thing to spend our time on. It's because a bunch of Vermont entrepreneurs and business folks and folks from all different sectors said, 
we care deeply about the state mm -hmm. and we don't think it's on a sustainable path economically. So what are we going to do about it? And then it's a little counterintuitive to draw the lines to zero. Why are then we focusing on zero to five early child education? Because of everything you just said, if you actually get this right, it's one of those rare opportunities that our lack of action is causing us extreme economic stress. And when we actually invest in it, it pays for itself immediately and three times over and then over a lifetime of the kids. And why does it do that? Um, so basically, as I mentioned before, when you invest in the system to actually allow there to be enough of it, high quality, and it to be accessible in an affordable way, the money goes to Vermonters. So Vermonters actually have more money in their pockets because they're not spending 30% of their income on childcare. The early education workforce, mostly women, poverty wages today, thousands of women making poverty wages in Vermont, they actually get a livable wage, more akin to a kindergarten teacher. So it's not wildly out there, it is just more akin to a kindergarten teacher. So that lifts an entire sector. Um, and then it puts thousands of people back to work. The RAND report estimated up to 3,000 Vermonters would go back to work immediately if they could find or afford childcare. The economic impact on our state when you put 3,000 people back to work is um, knowable. <laughs> it's like hundreds of millions of dollars. It's an econometric calculation that we've actually done with some of our partners before. Um, so that's just alone, if you wanna, Senator, put the workforce mobilization piece, that pays for itself annually over the annual public investment. Um, what Tax, that does to gross taxes state from 3, products, the taxes from those 3,000 being in jobs. And that and doesn't calculate- other economic impacts of their spending ability. Exactly. That doesn't calculate the impact, the sort of ripple effect of businesses being able to fill vacancies, yeah. increase productivity, and grow. So that's another whole other dimension. Then there's a secondary discovery, right? So, and by the way, to do this, you'd have to have about 600 new childcare programs and 2,000 more early educators. So you're bringing jobs into the economy through the supply. Um, and then all, they all have janitorial services, food services, right? So there's a ripple effect there. So a primary direct benefit, a secondary benefit, sort of multiplier effect. And then there's a, and people haven't really wanted to, lean in on this, but maybe as the education committee you do, um, because we're like, okay, well, this is an immediate investment we need. So what is the immediate and acute, you know, stimulus-like effect that it has? All the things I just mentioned, but the deep, deep potential savings and also benefit and sort of sustainability for the state of Vermont is when you give children what they need for a healthy life at the most crucial years of their development, but, but which is before five, when 90% of the architecture of your brain is formed. And I just want to sit on that for a second, because this is, again, what you all talk about in this committee a lot. It's, it's read and write and arithmetic, and it's executive function, the ability to have healthy relationships with others, anger management, critical thinking, um, the resiliency against addictive behaviors, you know, propensity for or against cardiovascular disease, diabetes, the, the the developmental origins of health and disease related to whether or not you're getting high quality and nurturing experiences before you're five is bone showing, I'll say. Very, very deep research on that, where actually, if you have a healthy environment between zero and five, or on the flip side, adverse child experiences, you're actually baking a diagram in your body of whether you're gonna have diabetes or heart disease. And so think about the potential to the state of Vermont when you go upstream and you support those kids in healthy development, we save so much heartbreak and so many dollars, and it turns around these death spirals that we're in on financing in the state. And then the final piece that is very hard to quantify is demographics. So we all know if we had a larger and if we had more people in Vermont, it would make our property taxes go down. It would make our schools, you know, not overbuilt infrastructure. It would make all of our income taxes go down. And so we all know we need to attract humans, but also young families, you know, particularly. Very few things do that. And that's why that's for kids focuses on childcare, because very few things have that potential. I just want to may I just ask one quick question about uh, Trinky. What about paying a parent to stay home? Great question. Um, I, I think, mean, I'm just curious. I mean, it's yeah. just popped to mind. So a bunch of things. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, um, a lot of people sort of ask about what about Scandinavia? And okay. we're like, well, there's so many things that they do that we don't do that we have to be realistic about where we are and what's best practice and what's realistic for Vermonters. Sure, um, sure you could do that, uh -huh. um, but it doesn't have 
an economic multiplier effect in, in any of these ways. What's um, the best thing for the child? I will say that What's the question, very best thing that for the question child? was asked Research in Senate finance yes. yesterday okay. afternoon, yeah. and Joyce yeah. Manchester was testifying about, well, what if we just paid a, paid a parent yeah. to stay home? And she said, kind of offhanded, I've run those numbers, they don't work. Um, but so. I want to know this is the <laughs> what's the best thing right. for kids. Mm -hmm. The absolute well, we what's can, the very best. So thing. there's very good research showing that a human who yeah. has a fundamental understanding of child development is a very important factor in the healthy development of a child. And yeah, this is why we must right. focus on the early education workforce as the key here. Yeah. Um, and compensation is the thing that makes those market incentives go in the right direction. Um, but also socializing and being around no other question. children. So right? you're saying so, the best thing for the children. Because this is a fair question. But, I just want to know. But I would say this is also, yes, plus a healthy dose of unity and freedom, Senator, the state that we live in. The, I, yeah, I think the fair. idea is not compulsory. Right. I think an accessible, equitably accessible system for yeah. these reasons of child development, but not compulsory because child development is varied. And that's why the mixed delivery no, system not is not compulsory, important. but is there yeah. is there an argument out there? Mm -hmm. We love, you know, this mm -hmm. this committee is a big fan of evidence. <laughs> Good. You know, we don't like to throw things that sort of hit. Totally yeah. see you. Totally see you. <laughs> Uh, and the question is, you know, we do ask ourselves all the time, mm -hmm. what is the very best thing mm -hmm. for kids? Is it, you know, and that's that's the research I was just trying yeah. to yeah. If we can dig a little more that's into the specific yeah. research, yeah. it's yeah. so, yeah. Un, it, it just it feels so unrealistic in the I US. Totally, I don't know totally, that people have completely. really done a deep dive into Some this. Some things are unrealistic. I think from right. our perspective, yeah. the really important thing is for families to have options. And Absolutely. right now, for so many families, Absolutely. there is yeah. no option, right? Yeah. They are staying home because they don't have access to yeah. child care. Um, and so we want families to be able to make that choice for themselves. Yeah. Like, do I you know why really use it? Yeah. I mean, this, yeah. this, this you know, I would like say, you said, everyone... purely anecdotally, when my son was born yeah. like, almost 15 years ago, right? We I got on every single waiting list. Didn't find childcare until he was almost two. Yeah. In spite of the fact that we are well, like well-connected people, yeah. live in you know the old north end of Burlington. He was almost two before we found childcare. And, yeah. You know, we have a master's degree, like not an early childhood development though, so he's fine. Um, but there were definitely when we finally found childcare, you know, when he was like socialized and did all the things. When he yeah. finally entered childcare, when he was almost two, it was instantaneous. The difference that I saw in him, just being able to socialize with other children, yeah. having and the things that I learned as a parent from yeah. early childhood educators so in his in his classroom yeah. too, it was like, oh geez, like thank God he's still alive and okay, you know, we did all right. But um, I, it's part of why I'm so passionate about this work is just seeing the impact on our our, our child and our family yeah. of having access to that was like night and day for us. Not to mention the fact that I could go back, we could both go back to work, you know, I could go back full time, like. The, our lives were so different, um, but it was, um, you know, that's my like anecdotal story of why we need to have this available to every family. Of course, we're never going to force a family to like go to work and put their kid in child care, but the fact that so many families don't even have that option yeah. right now yeah. is uncomfortable. And I'd love to highlight just two things. I'm, oh, Senator, you're so, you're so patient. Um, the, this idea of this two generation approach yeah. is something that's often yeah. lost, but the idea that you're a better parent when you have access to experts and support like an early educator. You often find an early educator is the person in a, a parents of a young child's life who is their most trusted advisor. And there, so you have this two generation impact on quality and then access to sort of early intervention and targeted services um, that again, support that child's healthy development uh, and early so that you can really do some deep prevention. Great, Senator Blue. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know. This is, I guess it isn't evidence based, but it is anecdotal. Yeah. You 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 repeatedly ask the question, Chair. Yeah. Um, what is best for kids? And I I, I mean I, I can speak to have, being on a school board and being plugged in to it to a certain extent. Um, one of the sad realities that came out of COVID for me was that there are a lot of kids who are not better off at home. No. True. It, it, in mm -hmm. fact, it was the exact opposite. Yeah, exactly. um, the trauma, the poverty, the addiction, among other things that we have in our country and our state, do not make always for a healthy Absolutely. home environment. So I think that question is kind of a loaded one and it's fairly complex. 
And another thing. Well, well, well hold on. Okay. I, I would say it's an important question. We want to. We everybody here has a right to ask a question. You get the. I totally agree. Okay, completely, yeah. I completely agree that COVID being home for some kids was really, really hard. But there are also situations that, you know, maybe a parent wants to be home. Should the state, should the United States say, hey, that child, if they want to be home, the parents should get, get some kind of salary or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, so I just want to agree with yeah. that. But I, I just, I also wanted to point out that from my perspective, in terms of outcomes, um, being home is not always the best. Totally. Option. Um, and then I did, this is sort of a, this might be way out there, and I know I'm, I'm probably generalizing big time, but when you, when you, it's hard also, I think, to look at the United States versus, let's say, Scandinavia or even Europe. When it comes to staying home uh, for a mom or a dad for a year, two years, I mean, in Canada, you can stay home for five years and be guaranteed a position, not necessarily the same one at the same salary. Um, but something. But, yeah, I, but I do think, again, this is just me trying to be like a social scientist. I do think Americans in a lot of ways, our identity comes way more from our work than a lot of other countries where your identity is more tied to family, community. You just you work less, you have more vacation. Um, and I do think Americans tend to connect their identity to work more um, and so I do think that's a little bit, of, that is a difference that yeah. can play out mm -hmm. in the equation mm -hmm. as well. But I also just wanted to say, I, I you know, I cry. These guys are getting used to me crying. <laughs> we have testimony, but your description of the importance of the first two, you know, yeah. two years, but it's just it's really hard to argue with that. It's um, so incredibly important and it's, will be, will pay dividends in so many ways mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Go yeah, ahead. well, I was just going to say, I know you have other witnesses waiting because I just saw them in the waiting room, but um, I we haven't talked at all about universal pre-K, which is a part of our birth to five system right, right yeah. now. And I think there will be many more conversations to come um, during the course of this legislative session, but that is a really important component of our birth to five system yeah. right now. And so that's the the system that, that the state established years ago for through Act 166, right, for universal pre-K. So we offer 10 hours a week for all three and four-year-olds in the state to have access to this universal pre-kindergarten program. Right now, about 60%, a little over 60%, I think, of kids in Vermont actually receive that service at a private partner program, so a child care program in the community that partners with the school district yeah. to offer that. Um, and that has been a really key component of our early childhood education system. It has helped improve the quality of early childhood education across the board for, yeah. for young children. Um, it has helped provide a stable source of revenue for child care programs that are partnering with the state on this program, where we know that the sort of the economics of running a child care business are incredibly fraught and it doesn't not really sustainable. This has been a really sustainable source of funding for those programs, which has been um, really key and has offered kids access. Um, the trick to a 10 hour a week universal pre-K program is that 10 hours a week is not actually sufficient for most working parents, right? Yeah. So that's why I think so many kids in the state are receiving those 10 hours a week at a child care program where they're actually there for like the full day, full year, right? Um, not just a school day, but the, their parents work day all year round. And they're receiving high quality early childhood education for the entire time that they're in that program. Yeah. Um, and then 10 hours a week of their of their time at that program is paid for through the education fund, you know, through the universal pre-K program. So practically speaking for a lot of kids, that's what it, it doesn't, it's not like, oh, this is the 10 hours that you're getting your universal pre-K, but the rest of the time you're just like in front of a TV or something. <laughs> it's actually the whole day, it's supported programs to be able to provide high quality early childhood education to kids the whole time that they're there and then that's sort of providing a stable source of funding through the state yeah so there you know some folks in appropriations have said hey why not just do pre-k you know across the board public school that would only bring it down to four years mm -hmm. is that accurate that's what i believe the bill is yeah used. okay so, yes and i think yeah. there'll be much more conversation to come around but, sort of yeah. what's in the bill what's national yeah. best practice yeah. what the our current um mixed delivery system is what it's known because you can get it through either through a private partner program or through a school district yeah um has been very successful in that regard i think and right. I mean, very hard to say to a school to offer hey you're gonna to. now offer zero through 
four mm-hmm. right real challenge yeah, versus yeah. But even, and even and even four I think yeah. I, I would just want to lean in on a couple of things yeah. from what Sarah said and enough so it's fine you have to sign because it. We, our, okay. our, our next witness I think right. can okay yeah, okay. You're okay um so we use the term child care just to be very clear because that's what the world when they hear it they understand it it is zero to five. We always say high quality child care, high quality, affordable child care. It's more of a semantics thing. I want to be very, very clear to piggyback off what Sarah said. It is high quality early child education. We really understand what the definition of that is as a community. And it is, it starts with the human in the room, the preparation and support of that human in the room. And as you see, it's something really historic has happened in Vermont. We are leading the nation, as usual, you probably hear that a lot, um, with advancing as a profession, the early childhood educators in Vermont, these folks yeah. in childcare zero to five and all these different types of settings have come together and with working with these national experts have agreed upon the term early childhood educator. They, there was no term, right? Is it a provider? Is it a daycare worker? Is it yeah. a childcare person, right? Like, no, it's an early educator and that's a consensus. And then what does it mean to be a profession? An early educator, A, B, and C with commensurate training, commensurate professionals, a real profession like we've seen nursing undergo, you know, over the years. And of course, to your point about what happens in those early development years, we know exactly what it is and we know what it takes to nurture that. And that's what the whole foundation of the early child education profession is based on. These folks then, so we sort of use the words a little interchangeably, but just to be clear, pre-K is a very specific program, as Sarah's saying, with specific dollars, targeting a specific way with a few more requirements. But really, the vision that we promote is a high quality setting that has these regulations and these standards that mm-hmm. promote that high quality because children don't turn it on and off 10 hours here, 10 hours there, or even like, you know, at home or whatever. They're learning constantly. They are doing this, you know, yeah. this crucial development in all settings. And that's why. And then you will hear things about best practice, like reducing transitions for young children. Very important. A four-year-old is more developmentally, you know, probably um, similar to a three-year-old than a five-year-old. These are the sort of things you will likely hear, you know, um, as you take in all the evidence from experts in the coming weeks and days. So I just really thank yeah. you for digging deep in this because it is complicated. Um, mm-hmm. And and the last thing I'll just say is, you know, that famous, uh, to your point about the work, that famous saying, why do you go to the banks? Because that's where the money is, you know? Um, well, that's, and to your earlier point too, why? This is the most crucial time in a kid's development. The question sort of was, so where are they? And it's just a change in our society over time that we have not really come to terms with. Many, many more of them, the vast majority of them just aren't at home anymore, whether it's because the women, woman has chosen to work, there's only a single parent, they must work to make ends meet, whatever it, the case may be, it is what is happening, and this is the most crucial time of their development, so if you want to have that impact, this is the setting, the platform to do it, and that's why we're focusing on it. So. Senator Rule. What are we going to have with Bill walk through here? Uh, we don't have the Bill. We, we, not, we, yeah, you know, we do. No, I know. We're well, going to get a walk You guys will get it. If only if it ends up when you guys are done with it, we'll like okay. get it in here. Okay. If it if, if but our real mm-hmm. jurisdiction legally is the pre K. Right. Case. Sure. Yeah. We'll be interested in knowing things like yeah. okay, what's the training like? You know, yeah. Early child Great. education. How Good. does that connect to then arriving in kindergarten, first grade, that kind of thing? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so we'll be eager to have those conversations. Should you get there here yeah, to talk yeah. about universal pre-K? Definitely. There's a whole world to dive into there too, but yeah. it's been a really yeah. important piece of the puzzle in Birth to Five in Vermont. It's been, we are one of the foremost leaders in the nation in terms of delivering universal pre-K, especially because we include three-year-olds in that system. Um, and in terms of our enrollment numbers too, we're higher than almost every state, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is it safe to say your ideal right now would be to allow a parent to, okay, if there's a pre-K at the local school, that works for him or her, great. But if they're in like my district, we also have a pretty well-known um, early childhood center. And high yeah. quality. Yeah. High quality. It started at yeah, Bennington College. Yeah. Mm-hmm. College said, hey, we just can't sustain this. Yeah. They said, okay, yeah. move it off campus. And mm-hmm. it is incredible yeah. so uh-huh. th- that is not that's still part that's an important part of the landscape that you all see out national best yes. practice okay. is a mixed delivery system for a, a myriad of reasons that i think you know i hope you all continue to sort of prod into yeah. you know from that evidence perspective from you know minimizing transitions full day and full year not yeah. just school day and school year um and and by the way this has been the system in vermont for some time now and 
you know, districts choose yeah. to do that partnership with their private providers for a variety of reasons. There, there's beautiful discussions of partnerships in Vermont for many, many years that go in both directions, you know, from the yeah. school and those private partners. I had one more thing and yeah, thanks too, just because this is the education committee. So we are definitely focused on birth to five, right? The child care financial assistance program supports young children, but it actually supports school age children as well. So the child care financial assistance program is the program that is also supporting a lot of school age children to access after school and um, summer camp programs. So the expansion that's in the bill that will be in health and welfare is looking yeah. at, I believe, from birth to age 13, um, up to 13, you can qualify for child care financial assistance. So I think they're thinking about expanding that universe. Um, and so the, there's like the, there's a, the after school component as well. So yeah. you know, that's of interest to this committee. And, and importantly, when we talk about mixed delivery, there isn't a robust after school system for four year olds. There isn't any after school system for four year olds. So if we're thinking about school day, school yeah. year for four year olds, that is a really it's a, that's a thorny issue for working families about how the, how that would work. And so I know that Quebec right. did this, correct? Mm -hmm. And there's something out there, you may have already sent to me, that yeah, shows the that economic, yeah. what would happen. So yes. I would love to see that yeah. sent to this committee and send it to Hayden. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to see that research also on, yeah. you know, I don't care what country is doing it, but paying parents, I'm curious to know mm -hmm. more about that. Right. Yeah, we should do a little research into yeah. that. We yeah. have a yeah. um, sort of a best practices document that looks at what Quebec did, what some other states are doing right now yeah. that we'd be yeah. happy to share with you all for yeah. the birth to five space. That'd be great. And just the summary, so you, when yeah. you're reading it, you see it, it, it you know, have the, in the back of your mind, basically Quebec did what we are suggesting, which is push public funds to support the compensation of early education workers yeah. and affordability for families. And they had women in the workforce numbers through the roof and they had gross provincial product go through the roof as well. And so that's interestingly in Quebec, they started just by expanding affordability for families without paying attention to the quality of that system or the, the compensation for early childhood educators. And it did not work initially work. until they invested further mm -hmm. to make sure that they were actually compensating early childhood educators yeah. and giving kids access to quality mm -hmm. childcare. Yeah. And now that's when they've seen the returns. That they so we'd love yeah. to learn from their mistake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and challenging up there because, mm -hmm. you know, generally it's, I mean, parts of your body like, well, but you know, how do you bring extra people into the workforce mm -hmm. from other provinces? Mm -hmm. And if they right. saw that, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Brooks. Yeah. Um, uh, I haven't really dug into S56 yet. I'm sorry. I will. Um, well, we've had like 24 hours. I know. <laughs> and this didn't happen yesterday. Um, there, is there any talk of after school or summer in the bill? Well, the CCFAP expansion that's in CC the bill, oh, I believe, right. would apply to kids up to age 13. So it would be anybody right. who's eligible for child care. Oh, okay. Yeah. The school age population tends to be much smaller portion of that just because yes. it's fewer hours a week that you need so it's not like the expense isn't that isn't increased that much by including school age children but it's a really key um, resource for families okay thanks yeah very interesting yeah. and important we look forward for to sure. continuing yes. to talk really appreciate the yeah. time and digging yeah. in and yeah. happy to follow up in, in any way yeah 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 thank you for thank your you passion for your time. yeah well, thank you Nice yeah. to see you all. Yeah, good to see you too. Yes, we certainly believe in it. So, yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's, that's so important. And a making lot, a case, right? A lot of us, um, a lot more than just me actually had twins too. So, and yeah. let's grow kids. So we sort of take the yeah. let's grow Three kids very seriously. We're trying to turn oh, the demographics your own staff. on our team. Yeah. yeah, something's in the water. So we're trying to turn the demographics around for you single-handedly over here. <laughs> yes. when, I work, when I worked for a <laughs> pair agency, there were so many families with twins. That, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that's honestly, I have a lot of friends who, as soon as they had twins, had to leave the workforce because yeah. they couldn't afford childcare no. for two infants at the that's same time. Yeah. It yeah. took me 11 months to find childcare, and I've been working in this space and no yeah. other program. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then I lost it when COVID happened. So, oh. it's a, a personal and professional journey. Thank you very much. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, committee, any yeah. thoughts before we move to Jennifer Samuelson on this? Anything, final thoughts? There are no thoughts on this. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> no, no. Just kidding. Oh, so many thoughts. So many thoughts. You're a co sponsor, right? Yes. Okay. S56? Yes. Yeah. Is that the child care? This child care. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. I have, I have, you know, good knowledge of it, but I yeah. not every single little. No, I was just curious. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, Ms. Samuelson, thanks for joining us. Hi, it's great to be back. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, so we thought we would just spend about you know, 10 or 15 minutes on the last time you were here, we talked a little bit about the state board, what it does, but I'm curious to know about its needs. You know, uh, what is it that you know, we have this sort of divided system, the Agency of Education, Secretary of Education, and then we've got this group, um, you know, the, the state board, there is a bill in the house, I know, I've heard of this, that kind of merges the two, which if we get it over here, we'll have you in, or if somebody else puts it on the Senate side, we'll have you, we'll have you uh, in to talk about it. But tell us a little bit about your needs on the state board uh, in terms of just general support. So that would be helpful for us to hear. And this is for us to keep in the back of our minds as we're talking with appropriations and as we're doing some of our work. All right, well, and so thank you. It's good to see everybody again. And I really appreciate being invited back to be with you this afternoon. Um, and, you know, I, I was trying to think of what I could prepare and, I, and, and maybe this is sort of <laughs> the essence of the issue um, because, I'm a little bit stuck on what to prepare, but I, I have some data that I thought would be helpful to share with you. Um, we haven't had a state board meeting since this request came. So again, I'm, I'm really speaking as an individual. I'm not here today on behalf of the full board. Um, I did send out an email to board members sort of soliciting their advice um, and suggestions. And I've also um, been communicating with um, Maureen and Suzanne at the Agency of Ed, as well as um, Emily Simmons, Donna Russo-Savage, and Jamie Craybill, who are sort of the, um, the primary attorneys in the state board's um, life just to get a sense of what they're doing on our behalf and how much they're spending, you know, on average. Um, and then I also have some data about, you know, how much state board members are spending um, per, you know, week, month, whatever. Um, so I can go through that with you guys as well. Um, so I, when I think about where we become reliant on the agency of education, it really breaks down into administrative support and legal support. Um, the administrative support, um, we, we would not be able to do what we do without Maureen and Suzanne um, helping us. And, you know, not only do they um, schedule the meetings, you know, assist with recording the meetings, um, they do all of the minutes for monthly state board meetings. And I'll just point out that means that they are not doing the minutes for subcommittee meetings. That has fallen back um, to be a state board responsibility. Um, but it sounds like a lot of their time is also spent posting and distributing documents and making sure that those documents um, comply with accessibility requirements. So much like everything that I'm gonna say, the amount of time that they're spending really depends on what's going on in the state board. <laughs> so, but um, Maureen Gatiss thought that it's, you know, roughly 10 to 12 hours per month that they're spending um, on our behalf. Um, but again, the more sub meetings we have, even though they're not doing the minutes, that yeah. will implicate their time because they're, you know, sending out the doodle polls, setting up the meetings, um, you know, getting the meetings started. Um, so that definitely takes their time. Um, and we've got a few subcommittees that are, you know, live and quite active at this point. Um, so that's the first bucket. The second bucket would be, um, you know, Emily Simmons, um, we rely on her for um, legal guidance. You know, when we did the 2200 series updates last year, um, she was our you know, primary contact that was really helping us um, in our subcommittee meetings and then, you know, before the full board. Um, and she estimated for me that when she was doing that work for the board, she was spending about 20 hours a week um, assisting us. This time around with the EQS, she's not assisting us. So we've retained outside counsel and he's only just started. So I don't, I, I don't have good information for you about how much time he's spending. Um, but you know, one, so you, one, you, yes. hired, you hired your own outside camp counsel to support the board's work to help us with the EQS. So, okay. you know, that, 
need was identified, I think, back in October. Um, you know, we put it out to bid through the um, Attorney General's office, and it took about three months from the time that we identified this need for independent legal services until we were actually able to get someone doing the work that, you know, we had identified as needing help. Okay. Um, next, we've got Donna Russo Savage. And again, her time varies wildly from, you know, a couple of hours a week yeah. or, you know, when she was helping us with withdrawals last year, um, she said it was, you know, almost a full-time job. <laughs> so again, it really depends. And, and I think what's really hard too, is it's hard to anticipate where these issues are going to arise. I mean, sometimes we can anticipate it if the General Assembly is like, hey, you need to enact rules that comply with this new act. Um, we know it's coming when it comes. I mean, as I sit here today, I couldn't tell you what's going to be put on our plate in a few months. Um, so it, it makes it a little bit hard to anticipate, but I think, you know, we exist at the behest of the General Assembly. And so <laughs> we're, we're here to fulfill that mission. Um, and then, you know, going back to the attorneys, the last attorney um, that we rely upon um, is Jamie Craybell from the Attorney General's office. Um, and she estimates that she spends about four to five hours a week. Um, but again, it depends on what we have that we're working on. And so, you know, for instance, she said this week's been more. Mm -hmm. um, so tallying all of that up, um, you know, on the low end, it looks like it's, um, you know, maybe two, four, eight, 20, 25 hours, um, combined administrative and legal, 25 hours a week. Um, at the high end, it would be over 40. Um, so I think, you know, this kind of goes back to the roles and responsibilities and trying to figure out what roles are going to remain state board responsibility, what roles are going to remain AOE responsibility, and then how do we best um, prepare for that and allow ourselves to do the work that needs to be done. Okay. Yeah, and like I said, we're, we're just trying to figure out a little bit those roles and responsibilities, costs, you know, what's, what's being pulled from the agency when they might be able to be working on other things and, and sort of vice versa. And, and don't want to, uh, you know, hamstring anybody in terms of getting their best work done for, for kids in schools. Uh, and it might be part of a, a general AOE assessment. Uh, and I think some of this work has been done in the past, but it might be, be just worth digging that up and trying to understand it. And, and then have you said anything, would you remind me, what do each of you get paid? What is it? It's like a hundred like bucks or something? Well, yeah. So interestingly, I pulled the, um, the, the guiding statute this morning. It's 32 um, VSA section 1010. And I'll be honest, I didn't even realize that the statute has been amended and will go, the updates will become effective um, this July 1st. So currently board members are receiving $50 per diem um, for any monthly meeting or subcommittee meeting or special meeting. Okay. Um, and anything beyond that um, gets billed at $6.50 an hour. I can tell you not a single board member <laughs> is, you know, completing timesheets for $6.50 an hour. Um, it's just, you know, I, I think we all have other jobs in addition to this. And I think people have decided that, you know, it's, it's easy to sort of keep yeah, track of the, yeah. the meetings that we're doing. Um, the other work. Is that consistent with what other payment is for boards like this, boards and commissions? It might not, you know, we can talk to uh, GovOps and find out, but yeah. Well, like so a little bit of a problem. Yeah. Well, and I'll be honest, when I was in Montpelier last week, I did not realize that other boards do make more than that. But I will say that the statute um, lists out the State Board of Education along with you know, 19 other um, boards and commissions. And so then again, like, 
I don't know what level of work we do compared to the Human Services Board or the Emergency Board. You know, there, there's you know other boards that are listed here, but you know what I do know is that the State Board has been charged with um, rulemaking and quasi-judicial appeals um, and. Um, you know, I'm just thinking through like the, a lot of the work that we've done, you know, we oversaw a lot of the withdrawals, um, you know, Ripton and Lincoln um, last year. Um, so, I mean, I, I feel like we are doing work that um, requires a fair level of sophistication um, and, you know, frankly, time to try to get it right. And a, a lot of the rules that we're looking at now have um, not only state constitutional implications, but U.S. constitutional implications. Um, so again, I think we all feel very responsible for, you know, giving it our absolute best so that we get it right. Hayden, I'm just going to ask him, uh, yeah. would you email the Agency of Education and see if there is, have we missed something around, uh, was there at any time in the past five years, a study and assessment of the State Board of Education with regard to compensation? Uh, staff support, that kind of thing. You got it. Okay, thanks. Great. Questions for uh, Ms. Samuelson. Yeah. And we can check with the, we can check with the administration also. It'd be interesting to sort of see, uh, Kendall probably would be the best person for us to reach out to. You know, just looking at all the, the boards and commissions out there, Fish and Wildlife Board, et cetera. Everybody's sort of consistent, you know, and I get there's different levels of responsibility for each one. Um, okay. Thank you for this. Sure. So, you know, I apologize. I, I just um, didn't have time to prepare anything before we met today, but if you would like, I'm happy to, um, you know, I, I crunched some numbers this morning and I'm happy to share that with you if you think it would be helpful. Yeah, if, if, if there's anything that you have time to just email along to Hayden, that would be great if you could share it with all of us if you think it's it's uh, you know, relevant and important to this conversation. And in the meantime, we'll see what Hayden pulls from the administration and from the Agency of Education. Okay. See if we can talk about this a little bit and maybe add it to a miscellaneous education bill. Terrific. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Thank you so much. It was really good to see everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye. Committee, any questions before we take a little break and move into pensions? Welcome back to Senate Education Thursday, February 2nd. We're going to just spend about 20 minutes talking about pensions, where things stand right now with teacher pensions, educators' pensions, that would also include sports staff. And uh, Mr. Fannin, the executive director of Vermont NEA, is here to talk about this as well as, if you don't mind, some follow-up on the letter that you wrote and some of the concerns that you have going forward. Sure. So. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. For the record, Jeff Bannon uh, from Vermont NEA. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, also, for the record, be remiss if I didn't say Hayden is home. Uh, sick, I understand. He shouldn't be working. He should be sick and getting well. Get well, Hayden. Yeah. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> stay home as long as you want. Yes. Do us a favor, stay home till you're well. Um, so I'll start with a bit of history. Uh, I, I've submitted written uh, documents. I have copies if you need it, but uh, I, this is not in my written submission. I have to pass out. Yeah, we don't have it. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Can I have one more? Oh, sure. I'll leave it with oh, my sure. colleagues. Okay. Um, you can have an extra. We'll put one. You have all of the file. Just less paper for me to take back. Um, thank you. Uh, just a bit of history here. So uh, this plan was established for teachers. Yeah. The teacher retirement system. Visters. I'll, I'll go. I'll use that name a lot here. Uh, Visters was established in 1947. Just state teacher system. Yeah. Created then. Started then. Um, and. Uh, I started Vermont in, in 20, 21 years ago. Um, the plan was pretty well uh, established then. And in 20, 2010, there were changes made to the plan. And essentially, they were uh, asking teachers to work a little bit longer, pay a little bit more, 
uh, and at the end of the road, there was a, a slightly enhanced uh, health care benefit in retirement. So work longer, pay more. Uh, and at the end of the road, if you, you met certain benchmarks, you got uh, an enhanced. What year was that? 2010. So they went from uh, teachers then went from uh, contributing 3.54% of their salary to 5% in 2010. Into and then, hang on, I'm getting there. You know, I want to know, when you say 5% of, of their salary went into, into the Vister system. Right. It's not a defined, so these are. Right. It's not a 403 b or whatever. It, no, it's not a 403B or 401K. It's yeah. a defined benefit plan. And what that means is uh, uh, it's a contributory plan. They contribute, teachers do, as do employers and the state. They all three contribute to the system. And at the end, you have a defined benefit based on your years of service, based on your salary, uh, a couple other actuarial uh, factors that go into it. And uh, you get a defined benefit pension until you're, you pass away. Mm -hmm. Now you can reserve some of that uh, pension for your spouse. It's, it's called the uh, joint survivor amount. How much can you? Uh, how much? Percentage wise. Uh, We're not gonna vote the I. You, know. you can, there are gradations, and I, I okay. so, how much the plan allows. It's like a corporate model. Yeah. The surviving spouse may have about 40%. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say 60, 40, but, but the, the, the system does allow you to take more and get less for your spouse. That's on right. your, so there are adjustments and gradations on that. Um, so it's, it's not definite, and, and you make choices when you retire, and they're irrevocable choices. Uh, you can't change them. Oh, I, I now have contracted some grave illness. I want to change it and yeah. reserve more for my spouse when I pass away. You can't do that. And that's it's it's a you know it's a risk for both at that point. Uh, you make decisions as you do when you retire, and, and you have to live with them. Um, and and the other two systems that that I'll talk about too are uh, VEMERS, the Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement System. VEMERS uh, is for the support staff paraeducators, clerical, uh, administrative folks, anybody who's not a licensed teacher working in a school who works for a school district that elects to participate in Beamers. Beamers is not mandatory. Visters is. All licensed teachers in the state of Vermont must participate and do participate in Visters. Uh, the district has the keys to that kingdom in terms of... Well, it, most often, well, yes. The answer is yes. Okay. And uh, a lot of times it happens at the collective bargaining table where you bargain uh, with your employer, the sports staff do, and they might might say, we want uh, that, uh, we want our employees to be in the Beamer system. So that would be the... Now, I wouldn't agree to comment. It just seems, strikes me as a, as a problem that, again, this is for paraeducators. We know that we have very educated paraeducation, educator group of people, roughly 50% of bachelor's degrees, which is incredible and great seems like we're saying leaving to certain people hey but but we're not going to give you this so i it, it just <clears throat> i think i understand your what you're saying yeah and and, and uh perhaps the posture on, on about on which you make that statement and i i don't disagree with it mm -hmm. but i will say that our paraeducators and our support staff are not highly compensated and so uh it is too also contributory yeah and they're Many paraeducators may not want to participate in the retirement system and take something out of their sure. paycheck. So, sure. so we're making value judgments all the time yeah. as we do, but um, it's it's typically happens at the local bargaining table where we agree this is what we think we want to do. Uh, and 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 lastly, as uh, <laughs> Senator Hashim knows, the uh, there's the state employees retirement system. Visitors, um, and that too, uh, that covers the state employees, yeah. troopers, and, and uh, um, in that regard. So there's that. Uh, in the Beamer system, just for quick uh, information, two thirds of the employees, the beneficiaries or participants in the Beamer system, are school based employees. So it does include truck, or excuse me, snowplow drivers, municipal workers, clerks, town clerks, and those sorts. But the vast majority, two thirds, are school based employees. Uh, all three boards, Visters, Vissers, and Beamers, are governed jointly uh, with a, a board that includes uh, employees, uh, in this case, two teachers, a retired teacher, the treasurer, and two uh, gubernatorial 
gubernatorial appointments, and the same for VMERS and VISERS. And, and uh, so they're, there's, they're jointly administered plans, uh, much like they are in the private sector. Taft Hartley Trusts uh, are also equally uh, divided, uh, and, excuse me, equally administered plans. So that's that, that's that's how they operate, and they the systems make decisions as they will. The pick Vermont Pension Investment Commission uh, makes investments and decisions about investments for all three plans, all of the state's monies. Um, and you might want to check in with the treasurer's office. They might they might be able to give you some details about the amount. I think it's approaching ten billion dollars. Maybe I'm off. Maybe it's eight billion, but there's a lot of money. I think that's a lot of money. I don't know. Um, being invested by B. Pick, and uh, uh, Tom Galanka is the uh, the chair of B. Pick. He may be somebody you might want to converse with. Uh, a quick aside too. This is all jurisdiction of the House. Excuse me, the Senate Gov Government Operations Committee. Uh, they deal with this on a more regular basis, but it does come up in education, as you know, and that's why I'm uh, happy to talk with you about it. Um, some other history, 2014, there were further changes to the visitors system where teachers paid even more. So they went from five to 6% in 2014 for new hires. Uh, anybody who was not yet vested uh, prior to, I think it was July 1 of 2014, uh, and any new hires thereafter also um, uh, pay 6%. So if you invested fully by 2014, you, you, you stayed at 5%, new hires are at 6%. As well, schools now contribute to um, a portion of the, of the plan, uh, and that started in 2014. So school districts now contribute some where they did not before. And we, uh, two questions. First, uh, in the 2014 shift, were there benefit changes or was it just contribution changes? Um, <laughs> I, I just jotted this note down. I, the answer is, has got to be yes, because it's typically thought of as a contract between the state and employees. And so when you change a contract, there's gotta be mutual consideration on both sides. I forget the detail of what uh, changed in 2014 for the teachers um, to uh, satisfy the contract clause issues that, that might've come up. Uh, and I apologize, I can look back. I was just curious if the educators at the time thought that it was kind of an equitable shift or if they created a turbulence. Well, I guess, I guess you know, it wasn't a contract claim because it was only for new hires, I apologize. Right. So prospectively, we just changed the contract, if you will, be prospectively for new teachers. Right. Not um, unusual in that time frame. Right, right, so, right, right. Uh, I'm going back on memory bank here a little bit. But uh, so there were no uh, benefit enhancements at the time in 2014. It's just uh, an increase to unvested and new hires going forward. So uh, trying to shore up the plan and making sure that it was there uh, well into the future, which is our goal. We wanna make sure teachers have a, uh, a, a decent retirement as, as deserve, they deserve. So that's what happened in 2014. Then we got to um, uh, 2021. Uh, there were some concerns with uh, the plans, the stability of the plans, uh, in the House and Senate, we uh, passed a uh, bill to study that. There was a pension task force that really dug into the details over uh, starting in July of 2021 and went in, frankly, to uh, January of 2022 beyond their, uh, I think they were supposed to only meet a number of times and in December, but they kept going because they were getting close and it was tough, tough work and they did a lot of good work uh, and came forward with a proposal uh, that was enacted uh, last spring. Um, and so, and that changed um, the rates, as you'll see on page two, teacher, the teacher rate um, going forward. And so we're in year one right now. Uh, year two is next year, starting July one. And then year three is supposed to go, go back to what the, the parties all thought was necessary, which is a marginal rate. It's sort of like your income tax based on how much you make, pay, based on that dollar for dollar increments. We went to the banded rates and figures one and two for administrative purposes in the year, uh, years one and two only. Uh, it was a little bit easier to administer for schools. Their, their uh, software systems couldn't uh, go to a marginal system, marginal rate system. So we all figured this out in the cafeteria last year as we did. 
uh, as often as the case, and uh, came up with the banded rates that, that they could live with, that we could live with in the short term. I know the treasurer has some comments about uh, going back to the marginal rates as, as agreed to last spring. Uh, and you might want to speak with the treasurer about that. And that's, I know that's something that's on his mind. Okay. Um, and, and we'll figure that out as we will. Um, a couple demographics there on going back to page one. Um, teachers are active, teachers at uh, 10,387, uh, retirees at 10,295. Um, that's, uh, it just demonstrates it's a, uh, a more uh, mature plan. It's been around since 1947. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see Beamers is a newer plan where you have a lot more active folks than you do uh, retired folks. And that's a, a less mature plan is how I would describe it. Sure. Just uh, curious, uh, active versus inactive teachers? As, as inactive versus um, retired? I mean, so, you, so teachers may be, uh, might work for a few years, have some credit in the system. Oh, and then might, uh, teachers are about 77% women, and, and uh, a lot of them take off time for child rearing, uh, which is great. It does, uh, it does really just reflect, I think, a lot of gender inequality uh, in, in pension systems because we, it's based on years of service. And if one takes off a couple of years to, to raise a family, uh, it does negatively affect them at, at the, in the retirement years. And same for Social Security. Uh, so I think these are, you know, that's just a demonstration of that, I would say. Um, and then uh, you'll see that the average annual teacher pension is only 22,500. Uh, and for Beamers, it's even less, 11,2. So that we're not talking about um, significant pensions here on average. We're talking about uh, people who uh, probably have had to supplement their income in some other ways along the way. Uh, and they have a 403B. Some people decide to, on their own to have a 403B. Uh, or we'll work a second job or something like that. So it's it's. This is no, after how many years of? So the average. Uh, I don't know this that is this Average year, uh, for years it was thirty years of service. Then it went up to thirty five to get the full health benefits. So um, the retirement office and the treasurer's office probably would have that demographic number for you. I think Colin Robinson may have sent you the valuation. From last spring in 2022, I think it was, or the 2022 valuation, and I could pull that up. That's okay. uh, but in there, I, I'm assuming there's a, uh, a demographic number about the average years of service a teacher, um, the average teacher in the system has. I don't know what it is offhand. Um, so when we talk about pensions, we're not talking about significant numbers here. Um, and just want to keep that in mind. Um, other post-employment benefits, OPEBs, healthcare. Um, oh, OPEBs. OPEB, other, uh, other post-employment oh. benefits. Um, it's often referred to as OPEBs. Um, and and uh, it is typically healthcare in retirement. It's also dental for teachers. Um, it's a one-time option, a one-time option only when, when a teacher retires, he or she uh, is entitled to elect a dental option. The, they contribute some towards it, uh, and same for healthcare. Although healthcare, you can go in and out a little bit. There's reasons for that, and unlike dental, um, so uh, many teachers do take the, the healthcare benefit. Not all. Uh, it's an election on their part. For whatever reason, they may not need it. Uh, the spouse may have coverage or something like that. And then, of course, when you get to social, uh, uh, Medicare, uh, it becomes a med sub plan, um, a Medicare supplement plan. So it, it just covers the holes, if you will, uh, for Medicare. <clears throat> um, and that's uh, for Beamers, for the, the school support staff. It's an incredibly modest monthly stipend for those school employees who are retired who have coverage elsewhere. There is no health care benefit provided by the state. Uh, it's a, I think it's about a $50 monthly reimbursement arrangement to those folks who have elected on their own to get health coverage elsewhere. Uh, and if you've priced out healthcare any time lately, uh, $50 is not gonna go a long way towards covering anything. So that's a rather modest benefit that we'd like to see enhanced. I think it's important to enhance it. Um, and 
we'll see what, what goes in that regard. So, um, and finally, I think it's important for you to note that um, uh, it's meant, as I said earlier, it's meant for mandatory for all school, public school employees, teachers, excuse me, who are licensed. And it's also um, the four historic academies also participate. Their licensed teachers also participate in Beamers, or excuse me, Visters. Um, uh, their unlicensed teachers do not and cannot. So it's just a licensed system. Um, the Visters will send this. And uh, again, the banded rates you'll see, um, we're talking about ranges uh, this year from 6 to 6.65. Next year, we'll go up from 6.10 to 7.25. And in theory, the marginal rates will go up all the way to 9% for those making more than $100,000. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So. Does, uh, does the teacher last immediately? I mean, as far as, you know, do they start earning credit at, at year one and just... You start earning credit in year one. And it's a, 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 a one year of credit is 175 days uh, and uh, of teaching. And then there's a, it's a two part answer to your question. Uh, teachers vested five years for their pension, but uh, pursuant to the, the arrangement that was struck in 2010, in order to get the health benefit, you have to work 15 years okay. uh, to get 60%. Uh, uh, 10, I'm sorry, I may be off. It's been, it's been more than a decade. I'll have to go back, but there is a, it's 60, 70, and then it caps out at 80 at 20 years the, uh, for the health care benefit. Um, so that's. And does it top out at, at, a, uh, at a period of service like 30, 35 years where the benefits, you know, it's flat or do they, can they just keep contributing until they, or is there mandatory retirement? Or it, there, there is a cap out, if you will. There is no mandatory retirement. Uh, my father-in-law taught for 37 years. Um, and uh, it, there is a, a, a limit to the multiplier. Of course, your salary typically goes up as you, as you continue to work. And so that helps in that regard. But there is no increase in the multiplier. Uh, Please. So, 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 I, I like yeah, this stuff. Yeah, so, I used to do a risk of work. I think it's fun. So, so uh, constituents have asked me 50 times in the last 24 hours about uh, something about um, a CPI, a promise. COLA. CPI. Okay. okay. What, and it's cost of living adjustment, COLA. COLA. Uh, so starting in 1981, I don't know what was happening then. I was not doing this work. I'll let you know that. <laughs> um, teachers were uh, set and, and, and did receive 50% of the cost of uh, living adjust or uh, the CPI, uh, Consumer Price Index of the Northeast, CPIN as it's known, I think it is CPIN or NE, uh, Consumer Price Index. So for years that went on and then you got 50% of the CPI. That's what they were promised uh, in statute, in documents from the retirement office, just so you know, Vermont and EA, um, jointly with the treasurer's office, the retirement office, puts on retirement sessions for members and, and teachers to uh, come and learn about their retirement system. It's one of the most uh, productive things we do at Vermont and EA. Uh, a lot of people go through it. Every, uh, teachers are, are, you know, they start thinking as we all do as you age a little bit, like, oh, what am I going to do in retirement? What is my retirement? And they start coming to these retirement sessions. Those are done with Vermont and EA as well as the treasurer's office. And we've done those jointly for years and they go around the state and they <clears throat> typically after school, there might be some uh, light refreshments and and, uh, and a couple hours of meeting with folks and trying to figure out, you know, help them figure out what they want to do when they, when they grow up. Kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so that, that's a, it's a, been a great partnership with the treasurer's office for many, many years. Um, and in those documents, the, quite clear that teachers get 50% of the CPI. Yeah. Um, in 2016, there was uh, concern over deflation. Teachers get 50% uh, of the CPI up to a cap of 5%. Um, and in the deal that was reached last spring, that cap was lowered to 4%. And the bottom, it used to be five and one, you get no less than one. 
and now it's four and zero. Those are the new caps and, and minimum and the max. In 2016, concern that the five was not at issue, the one was at issue, deflation. And so the treasurer came in, then treasurer Beth Pierce came in and said, hey, we need to protect teachers from a negative uh, CPI, if you will. And so they changed the language to protect teachers from a negative CPI, uh, a negative COLA. Uh, and everybody agreed there was uh, testimony in the House and Senate GovOps. That's what they were designed to do. That's all they were trying to do. There was no, uh, no discussion whatsoever about an inflationary time, all about deflation. And it was a rather uh, modest conversation. I think uh, Colin, we went back and listened to the tapes. Colin did, and I think he said he clocked it out at 90 seconds of conversation about the teacher system in this issue. Um, so we're not talking about a healthy, robust discussion, but it was clear from the treasurer's presentation and the deputy treasurer's presentation, uh, Michael Clawson, that they were there to protect teachers from a negative CPI. That's all they were trying to do, and everybody agreed. We did agree with that. That's what we wanted to protect. <clears throat> the language was redrafted in 2016, and uh, here we are in a time of inflation. Last year, the CPI, Northeast CPI, was 7.6%. Half of that would be 3.8. We thought, okay, if 3.8 is under the cap, retired teachers would get 3.8 uh, cost of living adjustment. The new interpretation that uh, didn't come about until I guess it was September, October of 2022 was that, wait, the language actually says you only get 50% um, so long as it's under the cap. So once the, it ex, once the CPI exceeds the cap, mm -hmm. 7.6 is over five or four for prospectively for teachers, but let's call it five for sake of discussion here today. Uh, you lower to the cap and then cut it in half to 2.5, 50% of the cap, if you will. Um, not how anybody understood it. In fact, it's not how the retirement offices documents in the, in the jointly done retirement sessions reflected anything. And moreover, from 2016 until the most recent valuation in November of 2022, the treasurer's office asked the state's actuary, Siegel, to cost out the COLA using the 50% of the CPI. So um, when you hear from constituents that talk about uh, this issue, what they're talking about is retired teachers are getting uh, 1.3, I think it is, less than what they were promised and what they thought the law promised them. So that delta for the average teacher at 22,000 is about $300 a year. Um, and then that's just an average, obviously not, you know, I don't think everybody's getting a 22,552, but um, that's the average we're talking about here. Um, and people, you know, obviously are not happy about that. Uh, and I think that it's, it's, you know, I've heard discussion about, oh, well, this will, uh, add to the a cost to the unfunded liability. Um, what I would say is there's no cost at all. There's no cost whatsoever. This was found money, right? The valuations prior to November of 22 all said 50% uh, of CPI. This is money that, that uh, rightfully, I, I would argue, submit to you, belongs in the pocket of retired teachers. They had it all along. That's what they were promised. Uh, we need to figure this out. Um, and so... That's what I think the discussion is all about um, and why I think you may be hearing from folks. Um, and, curious if sure. uh, the NEA has articulated this uh, scenario to the members and if, if so or if not, uh, any idea what may have triggered this very recent concern about, uh, about uh, CPI? We, we did inform our members recently about it, and that's probably why you're hearing from them. Uh, they're, of course, uh, the active folks in the classroom, so it'll it'll affect them if it's not fixed. The mistake, it really is a mistake, I, I would submit to you. If that mistake is not fixed, retired, excuse me, active teachers who eventually retire um, uh, will get 50% of something less than what they thought they were gonna get, just to put it bluntly. So I don't know, you know, depending on what the CPI is and all that fun stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of words in the statute 
that are now being interpreted to mean that the cap essentially is 2.5 or 2.0 for perspective for future retirees. I think we could have done this a whole lot more simply. If the cap was 2.5, we could have done it in probably 25 words. We didn't need uh, 200 to do that. And so I think, I think clearly it's a mistake that we need to, to address. You may also hear from retired teachers because the Vermont Retired Educators Association is also talking about it. I'm aware of that. Uh, and uh, these are folks who worked a long time, thought they were promised 50% of the CPI, and now are finding out their first checks with the, the reduced amount, if you will, the 2.5 as opposed to 3.8, went out January 31st. So they're, uh, you know, it, it, they, the state looks at the, the CPI last summer when they did that, and then it's prospectively into January, and that's so they they just started receiving, I guess, their first retirement checks that uh, are negatively affected. Okay, so that may be why you're hearing this from retired teachers. From retired teachers. Yes, probably 100 percent of them are other retired teachers. Right, it, because it affects them right now. Yeah, right. Uh, current teachers are not yet right. negatively affected, right. but will be at some point in the future. So, is there a line between the NEA and the Retired Teachers Association? I mean, do you, you know you represent the active teachers? We represent the active teachers. Okay. So, I, mean, I don't represent the Vermont NEA. Doesn't represent. Uh, okay. We have about uh, no 1,500 retired teachers, uh, so they would. In theory, get our, our mailing, but uh, we don't we're not bargaining on their behalf. You know, we bargain on behalf of active teachers yeah. with their local school. Yeah. We have my final question. Yeah, no, this, is, this is why we're here. This, yeah. is, this is good. And then uh, I do want to move on a little bit. Pension funding. Uh, I mean, I only know it by kind of innuendo and what have you, but uh, stability of the pension fund is there? Well, we want it. <laughs> we're concerned about it too. We want to make okay. sure that it's here today as well as tomorrow. Okay, maybe it's not your, you know. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by funding. It, it, uh, All I hear about is pension and stability. The, the, I, you know, the, if you have a position or an opinion or... Well, the, the actuaries every year come up with a number. It's called the actuarially determined employer contribution, which is the state contribution in this context, ADEC. Uh, and and uh, the state for the last several years has been putting in exactly what the actuaries asked of the state to put in. So that's good. And the deal that was struck last year put in a little bit extra to make up for, uh, I don't know, it was 26 prior to the last two, two years ago, 2021, 26 out of the 30 years before 20, 2008, maybe seven or eight, um, the state did not put in what the actuaries asked and, and requested. So there was a long period of time starting in the late 79, 80 where the state did shortchange or did not put in what the actuaries recommended. That does have an, you don't put in, you know, all of your mortgage payment, if you will, think of it in that way, uh, the principal is going to build up and that's what happened. And so th there's, the state has been since uh, for more than a decade, I think it is now, putting in what the actuaries have asked for. That's great, but you still have to make up for some of the past, uh, the sins of the past, if you will. And that's what last year's deal started us on an effort towards doing so. Um, so that we think that's good. We want the plan to be on good financial footing, as I say, for today as well as for tomorrow. Thank you. We may continue this conversation. Sure. I want to be respectful to the witnesses that have yes for about you know 10 minutes over. Uh, but this is very helpful and a, a great start. We might have the treasurer or somebody from his staff in to yes. pull some of this apart, but I appreciate this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. Thanks. Feel free to stick around. Yeah. In case Don has any questions. Uh, Ms. Vermont, please join us at the table. Is that how I did Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm realizing so the executive director of the National Alliance of Mental Health, Mental Illness in Vermont mm -hmm. asked you to join us Correct. today, which is terrific. Yes. So if you would be so kind as to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself what it was like to run uh, for Miss Vermont and then uh, jump into your priorities. That would be great. Yeah. And before we do so, let's just quickly just go around the table. So, um, you know, who's here? Hi, I'm Nader Hashim from Dumberston, representing Wyndham County. Nice to meet you. you too. Hi, I'm Martine Laroc Ulick from Burlington, representing Chittenden Central. Nice to meet you. Brian Campion, Bennington County. Dave Weeks, representing Rutland County from Proctor. 
Awesome. Nice to meet you. And thank you so much for having me. Um, so a little bit about myself. So my name is Alexina. I'm a business owner. I'm also Miss Vermont um, and I'm a mental health advocate. I got involved with NAMI Vermont as a speaker talking to students about mental health in high schools and middle schools. Um, as someone who struggled with my own mental health, for me, it felt really important to come back to the state that I struggled to be able to tell the story of my own lived experiences, as well as share resources and updated resources because as a teen, for so many years, I struggled in silence and in total denial of what I was going through because I had never heard anyone openly share their own experiences. And we've come a long way about destigmatizing mental health, but we still have so, so much more to go. And um, I'm going to share a little bit about my experiences from visiting schools with NAMI, but also um, I started a nonprofit that focuses on interactive programs that I've taken all over the state of Vermont and talked to hundreds of students and parents um, about mental health and about how to take care of our minds just like we do our bodies. Um, the programs range from K through 12, so you get a range of students um, and different topics that I bring up to be able to hopefully slowly destigmatize mental health. And the more I enter schools, the more I realize how much more work there needs to be done. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about those experiences as well as my own lived experiences to hopefully give you some insight um, into my findings and my own experiences. Awesome. So, um, so I was born in Bennington, Vermont, and I spent all of my young adult life, young adult life in Vermont. I studied interior architecture at Cornell University um, with a minor in health, hospitality, and design, which is a fancy word for where the intersections between hospitality and healthcare can see and kind of learn from one another. Um, and I wrote my honors thesis on the study and design of behavioral health facilities. Um, so you'll see mental health is something that has been kind of in my life um, at, at, at pretty much all points. Um, and during the pandemic, I saw such a huge increase in mental health struggles within schools, within my own, um, as a graduate student, um, there was just so much more talk about struggling. Um, and especially in our school systems. I think that's where the biggest focus is. Um, and so I took a project that started in graduate school and I took it a little too seriously and started a nonprofit um, around um, the Feel Better Way. So that's the nonprofit that I spoke about that offers support to Vermonter students struggling with mental health issues. So I created a book that is kind of an interactive program to be able to present to hundreds of students all over Vermont. So the book itself is written for like little me of what I needed when I was younger, explaining what goes on in our brains and how can mental health affect me versus my friend next to me? How can I support one, my friends if they're struggling? How do I know if I'm struggling? All of these unanswered questions that I had that I wish someone had told me about. Um, and I try to use a unique perspective of using illustrations to be able to showcase feelings and emotions in a way that doesn't feel either exclusionary or um, not seeing yourself, whether that's race, color, identity within pictures and ideations of people who are struggling. Um, and so through um, this, I'd like to share um, what I've learned. So I'd like to start with an analogy. So about the current state of our students. So imagine you're in a beautiful park and there's a calm, tranquil lake that feeds into a raging river. At the end of that river, there's a steep waterfall um, and that crashes down onto jagged rocks. You see a kid struggling in the river. And so you jump in to try to save him. Um, you successfully drag them back to safety, but you're emotionally and physically exhausted. You look back and then there's another student coming down the river in that same struggle. And so you are able to somehow jump back in the river, grab them, and you look to your right to the lake and you realize that there are hundreds of students in that lake charging for that same river to that same fall. And you realize you can't save them all. The waterfall is when a student is in mental health crisis situation. This is unfortunately where so many um, or so much focus on mental health resources are centered. Um, mental health crisis increased for teens, girls by 50% in 2019 to 2021. And a teen takes their own life every 100 minutes. So these are just a few statistics um, that just kind of shine a light on how serious of a problem this is. Um, and it really surrounds itself around students in high school, middle school, and college. Um, there is undeniably a need for inpatient beds for teens. These are kind of emergency facilities, um, suicide prevention resources. However, this focus on crisis situations can mean teens who are struggling, those in the river, um, cannot get those resources until they are in crisis, tumbling onto the rocks at the bottom of the waterfall. So that was me struggling for years without any help. 
During middle school and high school, I became anxious and depressed after relentless bullying from being from a low income single parent home and struggling with a reading disability. I began to develop severe anxiety for not fitting in and not being included and for struggling with my reading disability and being called stupid, being called the R word. Um, I eventually began to self isolate and I became depressed. Um, from the outside though, I looked totally normal. I was a happy kid who was friendly, eager to make new friends, but okay if people excluded me. Um, and maybe if I ignored all of those feelings for long enough, they would go away. But I noticed that because I wasn't falling off that waterfall, <clears throat> that I found it harder and harder to hide my interior mental state. Um, and I found self-harm to be a new mechanism to cope. I would hurt myself from the outside so I didn't have to feel what was happening to me and the feelings that I didn't want on the inside. When I got into the school of my dreams at Cornell University, I hoped that a lot of things would change. I'm in a new area, new college with people who have no idea where I'm from. Um, and I made friends really quickly, some of my best friends and school was rigorous, but I was very successful. You'd think that my mental health would be better or at least somewhat at ease. In the middle of freshman year, however, I started feeling those same feelings of self-doubt, anxiety, and stress. And again, through the outside, I looked fine. I called our school medical center and asked for mental health resources. And after an evaluation, I was told that I was coping really well and that the high volume of students that they had meant that I would not be considered. So I continued to try to paddle upstream. So many students in that same position struggled just the way I was, unable to make it back, unable to create coping mechanisms because they're so deep in and just trying to tread water. Most mental health offices are understaffed and overloaded, and so many students give up just like I did. After years later, I was so overwhelmed with feelings uh, that I decided to give up and finally fall down the waterfall. I attempted to take my life, and I woke up in the ER. I finally got help that day, and but only after I completely hit rock bottom. So many people are turned away from not being severe enough not being in crisis. I once was on a nine months waiting list after losing my job and my health care, and I was told by more office than one that if I wanted help sooner, I should go check myself into a psych ward, even though I was not suicidal. My experience, however, is not unique. I've spoken to dozens of students and parents who have been waiting on months for months for an appointment with a counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, desperate to find help for their child. This is because all of the emphasis is on emergency care, but not for preventative care. Adding additional resources is absolutely necessary to help the students struggling in the river and in the waterfall. More inpatient beds, more emergency counselors, more school clinicians and crisis helplines. But these take time and money to implement. And there are other, another possible avenue for assisting youth that could help them avoid the struggles on crisis downstream. Implementing social and emotional education and curricula to all students in the lake and normalizing mental health issues will improve students' mental health by identifying potential issues early and encouraging self-care. This could be implemented quickly by mental health awareness to existing health curriculum, like school health class, where we learn about sex ed, we learn about nutrition, but we don't learn about mental health. We don't learn about how to help ourselves and how to keep ourselves healthy and how to cope with the increase in stress that we all go through, but really suffers on our students, especially. Um, designing an anchor point, which is having one adult for a student that they can kind of check in with and just have someone who knows that I'll be checked in on or someone will ask if I'm okay. And if I'm not, I know that teacher is there for me um, and checking in with youth on a regular basis. So in summary, um, I think the education sector has a huge opportunity to be able to increase the amount of talk about mental health, about depression, about anxiety um, at younger ages and in the curriculum that is already there to be able to help give students the tools so that they can help themselves, so that they know warning signs before they get ignored, before they are in crisis, and that's their last chance. Thank you. Alexina, thank you, uh, thank you isn't enough. This is was incredibly powerful and helpful. And frankly, it's testimony like yours that legislators need to hear often. Uh, and it's a great reminder and for you to share such personal experiences means a lot to me and I know to, to everyone at this table. So thank you. And um, let's open it up to some questions. 
question, guys. If you talk about pensions, it's one thing. <laughs> no, I do respect yeah. your personal sharing your uh, personal situation. It's very, very powerful to the chairman. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I would just say it fits in with a theme that we've all been hearing and experiencing for sure, especially, I mean, in health and welfare, yesterday's testimony. Oh, yeah. it's, it's real and it's ubiquitous right now. Oh, you, you mentioned something that I almost sort of forgotten about. Because we don't talk about them as, as much, and I don't know how much they're around. Um, what is it? Uh, Helplines. Mm -hmm. Do we, is that, and this isn't really for you to answer, but I'm just asking myself back in the 90s, there were all sorts of helplines, 80s, 90s. You know, I remember my partner worked for one for LGBTQ people that, you know, just want to call up, talk through their stories, that kind of thing. Do you know if the helpline is still out there in some? Yeah, so oh, there, okay. there are mental health um, resources and helplines that, there's kind of the crisis focus, um, which in the past um, year, 988 became the national um, mental health hotline that used to be the suicide preventage hotline, which was a number no one could remember. It was 88843. I don't even know it. Yeah. Um, and so they now, like 911, made it into a shorter number, and they saw a huge increase in calls of people calling, um, and especially students. Um, I was at a presentation from one of those people who answers those phone lines and they said that the number increase is dramatic. There are also resources um, like 741741, which is a national, more of a, I feel not okay and I'm not really sure where to go. I'm not sure what resources are available to me. But one of the biggest things that I've heard from students about those helplines is one, misinformation. I heard from one student saying, and I, I guessed that this information was probably being um, interact inaccurately given to them by a parent that you have to pay money you to use those. All, all they want to do is, is get your information, um, don't call them, and they're not helpful, they're not resourceful. Um, so I've heard that from a, a good amount of students. I've also heard students who had no idea uh, that there were such helplines. Um, and there's also this, the, that's another kind of between a rock and a hard place is parents being accepting of schools and of people bringing up those resources. There's this huge fear that if you bring up these resources, um, talk about suicide, um, that it will increase the number of suicides, and, and that is statistically incorrect. Um, and it's an unfortunate place where some schools feel like, is it really our place to talk about this? Um, if we send students home with resources like 988, um, are we making our students or our children think about suicide, think about mental health struggles? Um, and, and that is far from the truth, but unfortunately something that I think keeps the education system behind in this fear um, of having parents disagree with the information they're given, even if that information is trying to save their kids' lives. Do you ever know if there are, is a Vermont help helpline? In other words, it's one thing to get something <laughs> down in DC mm -hmm. or out in California, but Vermont is, is its own unique issues, culture, and, and, and having somebody at the other line to understand that could be key. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so both of those helplines as well, there's um, the Trevor Project that has their own helpline um, for LGBTQ plus individuals who want to talk to someone who will understand their experiences and their stories. And all of those helplines, the ones I've mentioned in the Trevor Project um, are organized so that they get distributed to the closest near sector, um, for example, state by state. So some student who calls in Vermont will get someone in Vermont. Um, and I spoke to one of um, the suicide prevention hotline, um, I, guess, I don't know what, what their caller or like answerer, um, and she said that she has never heard of a case where it wasn't reached, and if it was, it would get transferred to the nearest area, so New Hampshire, for example, or New York. Um, so all of them are pretty standardized to be localized, um, but I mean, it's still um, another thing with students that becomes really difficult is when they're not on their own parents' insurance, how do you get that help? How do you get those resources? 
kids are have spoken to me about not knowing if oh well, I don't think my mom would want I don't want my mom to know that I'm struggling so I don't want to go to a healthcare facility that would be connected to my insurance um, and that's why I think focusing so much more on preventative care um, and educational tools um, and you know hotlines and helplines are great but giving them real tools of how to deal with stress is way more important um, and the stresses are going away um, as someone who studied environmental psychology there's so much research and and dedication behind the reasoning we're seeing such increase in mental health. I mean, there's all sorts of predictions, but one of the big focuses is that um, as we are developing in cavemen, all of those stressors were short. They were acute. The stressors now are long-term, you know, political stressors, stressors of um, divisiveness between race and identity, um, paying bills, going to college, paying for college, all of these stressors are becoming lifelong. And that's why we're seeing, especially within students, such a high increase in mental health struggles because um, there's, um, and unfortunately a lot of students, I mean, you tell students from a young age, um, put on a bright face, put your best foot forward, but we're never told if you're struggling, reach out for help or it's okay not to be okay. And that kind of language change within education, I think would make it more and more acceptable for students to know who to go to if they're struggling or know that it's okay to struggle and that it's normal. Um, normal is a, a, a charged word, um, but I use it because that's all I wanted to feel when I was younger. But if you ask a professional mental health, they say normal is a bad word, but. Mm -hmm. so, so I understand you're Miss Vermont 2022, right? Mm -hmm. Are you running again in 23? I wish they won't uh, let me. They're uh, not uh, picking uh, me out, but um, I will be continuing to do everything that I'm doing. Um, just as me. So I can tell you one way that you've already made a difference in this committee is next week we are hearing from physical educators and and men of uh, and health teachers and front and center for me, for sure, will be talking about that preventative care. What are the strategies that we are giving to kids, whether it's meditation, how to just accept all, all that kind of thing. So, so thank you. Yeah, thank absolutely. You. And I, I'm sure I speak for all of us. If you do have ideas, if you want to continue to partner with us in any way, uh, email those things to Hayden Ross. We would be more than happy to the conversation so absolutely I, uh you have our most sincere thanks for sharing and we appreciate everything that you're doing in our schools talking to kids particularly since it's helpful that you know sometimes an old guy going into school is one thing but somebody who's young you know somebody who's willing to share their experience somebody that they can relate to day and night so thank you very very much you'll be surprised though. sometimes they remind me that i'm not hip and i'm not with it <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I think I think that does make a big difference. Thank yes, you so sure. much for yeah. letting me talk. Yeah. Um, and I will be sure to send I send of ideas um, and ways um, to be able to incorporate that into the school system. So I will make a presentation and send it over. We would welcome that. And just so you know, our committee is live every day. Uh, when we do take up a topic, our agendas are always posted. If there's something again that you find compelling that you would like to weigh in on, please let us know. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you it so mean much. A lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for making the time. And uh, mother, uh, yes, Deborah. Deborah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining us as well. <laughs> great, great. Speaking of old guys, no, uh, no, uh, 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 well, you're a good couple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, as a parent educator, I was yeah. interested in proceeding. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tinney, thank you very much for joining us. This is a topic uh, in the public schools that I we're looking for different ideas, different mm -hmm. things we can do right now. And just to tee it up a little bit, when I met with uh, local superintendents recently in my district, the message was, hey, right now, because of ESSER funds, you know, we've been able to access, you know, higher family engagement people, some mental health professionals. That's going to end, and that is a big concern, but also just finding people out in the community to do this work. So, and we also know from stories from across the state, across the country, this we're at this crisis. So, absolutely. Thank you. So, good afternoon for the record. My name is Don Tinney, a high school English teacher from South Hero, currently serving as president of Vermont EA. I too am here upon the request of NAMI Vermont. 
I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today as you engage in important conversations about mental health. Having testified on school safety last week and universal school meals yesterday, I can't help but note how the threat of mental health is woven into these two issues and woven into almost every other issues our students, families, and educators deal with every day. I respect and appreciate groups like NAMI Vermont and the Vermont Department of Mental Health who have worked tirelessly to reduce the stigma previously associated with mental illness. Removing the stigma has allowed us to have real conversations about depression, suicide, PTSD, anxiety, substance abuse disorders, and other psychological conditions. Our educators, especially our school counselors and school nurses, must have time and resources to provide developmentally appropriate lessons for our children and youth, equipping them with the vocabulary and the comfort level that will allow them to engage in meaningful conversations about mental health, enabling them to seek the help they need and encourage their peers to find support. And I'd add that you just heard a perfect example of exactly that. <clears throat> I'm sure you've seen the 2022 State of Vermont's Children Report, recently published by Building Bright Futures. This, <clears throat> this comprehensive report details the many social and psychological issues facing our children and families today. While the report focuses on children from birth to age eight, the identified issues remain relevant for our students through grade 12 and beyond. Our schools are reflections of our communities. So we must remember that every societal challenge will sooner or later arrive in our classrooms. I will restate the concern you have heard in previous meetings. Our communities are in dire need of mental health care professionals. We need more school counselors, social workers, psychologists, school nurses, and behavior interventionists in our schools. The wait times for students to see a mental health clinician are unacceptable. The Vermont Department of Mental Health, the Department of Children and Families, and regional designated agencies are important partners to public education, and they need to be fully funded and fully staffed so they have the capacity to serve our students and their families. The lack of inpatient services for youth with severe needs has created extreme hardships for too many Vermont families. Years before the pandemic, educators were frustrated with how long their students had to wait to see a healthcare professional after they made the proper referrals. Not only are those wait times even longer today, but our educators themselves are finding obstacles to accessing the mental health care they need. Even as adult professionals with adequate health insurance, many find it difficult accessing health care because of its high costs, the frustration of dealing with third party administrators and complicated insurance billing systems, and perhaps most importantly, the availability of providers. Given the nature and importance of their work, including the fact that they often absorb the secondary trauma of their students, educators need to have affordable and easier, if not immediate, access to mental health services. I understand the Agency of Education and the Department of Mental Health are oh, working. Second, Senator Bullitt, you need, we cannot continue. Can you, do you mind waiting until uh, maybe texting Senator Hashim? Okay, yeah. We just need to have a plan, please. We're going to say she and we applaud their efforts in supporting our educators. I've included links to the American Psychological Association that issued a report last spring explaining some of the issues our educators are facing. Knowing that our students were struggling with their own trauma before the pandemic, Vermont NEA received a grant from the National Education Association Center for Great Public Schools to sponsor our May 2019 Summit on Safe, Compassionate Learning Environments at the Burlington Hilton, where we brought together school board members, administrators, educators, and mental health clinicians for deep conversations about meeting the emotional needs of our students. At that time, students had identified anxiety and depression as their major concern for their peers while educators were witnessing an increase in disrupted learning. Later that year, Vermont NEA joined our counterparts in New Hampshire, Maine, Rhode Island, and Connecticut to explore new possibilities in professional development for trauma-sensitive practices that supported the social and emotional well-being of our students. We worked with Dave Melnick of NFI Vermont to facilitate a series of webinars over the summer and fall of 2020. While we value professional development for our individual educators, we came to realize that our institutions must take a more systematic approach to supporting the social and emotional well-being of our students. 
sending individual educators to a workshop and expecting a district-wide change will be disappointing. So we need to focus on the system and not only on individuals. As James Clear writes in Atomic Habits, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your system. Knowing the importance of taking a district-wide, even a community-wide approach to improve our systems, Vermont NEA has formed a partnership with the Maine Education Association, NEA Rhode Island, and representatives from the association leaders representing school boards, superintendents, and principals to expand and strengthen labor management collaboration with a focus on mental health. As an aside, researchers at Rutgers University have found that strong labor management collaboration improves student achievement and increases educator retention by as much as 14%. While we're in the early stages, we are hopeful that this shared leadership approach will contribute to the continuous improvement of school climate and support for the mental health of our students. One example of this might be a team of educators and counselors evaluating the pre-K to three curriculum following the imposition of common core state standards and high stakes testing to decide whether or not we should return to a more play-based curriculum in which students can experience the pure joy of learning while developing healthy relationships. In closing, I would like to remind all of us that part of growing up is learning how to self-regulate one's behavior and emotional responses. For example, an occasional temper tantrum when we were two might have gotten us the attention we craved, but it is not an effective strategy later in life. As educators, we must teach our students how to self-regulate through what is now often referred to as social emotional learning. Many educators across the nation are having success with mindfulness training and yoga practices to support their students in learning how to self-regulate. I want to be clear that emotional dysregulation and subsequent disruptive behavior is not always a sign of a mental health condition, but often it is. So this is one clear example of why our schools need to be staffed with mental health professionals who can make those distinctions and provide the necessary services to students, their families, and educators. Thanks, and happy to answer that question. Thank you. Any questions? So we have a lot to do on this front. Without Absolutely. Doubt. Um, I know Mr. Fan was in talking about uh, one possible idea, which I think is, is a very good one, and you mentioned it also, increasing, of course, the mental health professionals mm -hmm. in school. And easier said than done, because partly it's around training and making certain that people you know, are in the workforce to do that work. Um, there, I didn't mention, yeah. we do have, you probably, as you're probably aware, we do have right now, I think, five community schools, uh, pilots community schools. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think um, those show great promise. They certainly do across the, uh, other parts of the nation. And that's what some people refer to as wraparound services. And those services sort of built in. I think the important thing to remember is it's, it's those designated agencies, departmental health, you know, and others who, who can help her because that's where the kids are. Yeah. That's a great reminder. And for new committee members, this is a bill that came from the House last year, uh, basically a pilot program. Uh, and we'll get an update on that because I think possibilities of expanding that um, are huge and incredibly valuable. We so saw how they actually kicked off because, you know, the yeah. funding lags and uh, right. No, I think they started this year. I think this, this is I think this is the first academic year where the pilots in place. It, uh, do you know where they are? I don't off the top of my head. I know the AOE oversees them. I think just the Carlos at AOE is the person who yeah. oversees okay. that. Program. Thank you. Mr. Fanny, do you happen to know where they are? I don't. I don't know. Do. Yeah. Yeah. I remember calling AOE this summer because as for this fall, as some of the issues around behavior were popping up in Bennington, I was wondering if that district, if, if they had applied and they said they did not apply. And, and that's the other tricky thing I want to get my head around is you know, some of these districts that are struggling the most don't have the personnel to write applications and right. that sort of thing. You've identified a very serious problem and that the, the smaller districts simply don't have the personnel to write grants. Well, yeah. larger districts have grant writers. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, it, it is um, unfair when, when we see programs that are grant dependent 
um, that that's, that's going to be a hurdle for, for some. It's the same with small municipalities as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, committee. Thank you all. Uh, we'll wrap it up tomorrow. Any final comments, questions? I will send you a list. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, uh, the report from the AOE there is a board. That'd be great. Community schools. Has a policy. Okay.